number 57 of Chatting with Nuts. I am so happy to have you here on this beautiful, beautiful Friday night in June. It is a hot boy summer. I had to wear the tank because this room gets hot. These new lights are giving me a tan, but also a heat stroke. Welcome. I am tuned up off coffee. I am, of course, your host, Jimmy Nuts, the Friday Night Delight. And today, hide, <laughs> hide your mothers, hide your widowed aunts, because we got the zaddy of the zads. And that is best-selling self-published author, Philip Chase. How you doing, Philip? <laughs> that was... <laughs> Jeez, Jimmy, thanks for that uh, introduction. <laughs> Widowed that's, ants. That, that's I think one. you just I, I mean, stole I every to, word I was about to say right out of my mouth right there. So, yeah. All I'm right. We had all the cool people I think, in the I chat. Think I, I broke Philip, folks. Either that or my internet's going down, one of the two. Oh, thank you, Scott. Let me know in the chat if it's my internet. Oh, you're back. Was that oh, me? Was I gone? Was I gone? Was it me or you? I have you, no clue. I, I didn't see me gone. I just saw me there, but. Yeah. It might have been me. But either way, uh, I'm going to have to use that again. Uh, I got to wait like six months. It'll be brand new, though. So, Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> I actually said, I don't know if anyone heard me because I, apparently I froze. I think it was me. I think I cut out. Oh, okay. Because Verizon is absolute garbage. But that's okay. That's okay. We're hanging out. We're having a good time. Okay. I had a good workout today. The thing I love about this show, Philip. And I don't know how, if you feel like this, but every time I do this, I feel like I get motivated to read. And Philip, I need some motivation to read right now. I'm going to, I'm going to be honest. I've been struggling lately. I don't know what it is. I have been so sporadic in my reading. I keep picking things up and reading like a hundred pages and then just putting it down, not like DNFing, but just being like, like I read the first chapter of house of chains. Why did I do that? Like I could have been using time to actually read stuff on my TBR, but I was like, I really just want to remember the Carsa intro. Like, uh, what's what's wrong with me? Do you get motivated by these? Like, do you ever like leave one of these and be like, I'm ready to read? I get motivated. I, I think, yeah, no, I'm, I'm I'm definitely motivated by talking about books with my friends. So mm -hmm. that, that definitely gets me up in the morning for sure. Uh, and excited. Uh, you need more buddy reads. That's what you need, Jimmy. I don't because then that adds even more pressure <laughs> and then I feel bad. So I, I, <laughs> I do have a buddy read coming up uh, with Kai and Kevin for Otherland by Tad Williams. We were going to do, wow. cool. yeah, we were going to do Last King of Ostenard, but they pushed back the last book. So I'm like, well, it was originally supposed to be Otherland. Like we switched to Last King of Ostenard. So now we're back to Otherland. And uh, man, I'm really excited about that. I feel slightly guilty because I started Shadow March back in like March. <laughs> and wow. uh, I didn't continue, but I loved book one. I thought it was fantastic. I actually have a review that I need to post for it. Um, so it feels weird starting a Tad Williams series and then just jumping into other land randomly, but I'm excited for it. Cause I, I, I hear it's like nothing else. Like other land is just completely like outlandish. I was trying to find a pun there. I couldn't. It was, you came pretty close. That was pretty good. It was uh, in the ballpark. Yeah. I didn't realize how much Tad Williams has sort of skipped around and tried different genres over the years. I've been seeing, I saw him in an interview on page chewing the other day. Uh, and it was really cool. It was a great discussion. I don't know if you caught that or not. Yeah, I saw. I, I haven't got to watch all of it, but it was with uh, PL and Taylor, right? Was no, Taylor? PL and Taylor were both there. Uh, yeah, and they were talking to Tad Williams, and he's done. I mean, he's he's really moved around with different genres a lot. And I didn't realize it because I've only read, uh, and this was more than twenty years ago. Uh, Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn. That's all I've read of him, and I love mm -hmm. that that. Uh, my favorite uh, three book, four book trilogy ever, you know? Uh, so <laughs> it is a four book trilogy. It inspired George to write his seven book trilogy. He said, yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah, he, people, actually. Yeah. Yeah. He's been uh, prolific and his inspirations are, are very interesting because you have the contrast of Moorcock and Tolkien, but he also likes a lot of the classics too. So He's just a, he's a well-read guy and he's, he's a very smart guy as well. And he played in like a jazz band at some point too. I mean, he's just a very, you know, he's lived a good life. I, I could say that he's done a lot. Yeah. That is one thing I really like about Tad Williams is I think often it feels like the way people talk and I don't believe this is true, 
but often you get this impression that there are like these two camps of fantasy, right? There's the Tolkien mm -hmm. traditionalist, you know, classic fantasy camp. And then there's the, the edgy, you know, grimdark or, you know, whatever preceded grimdark kind of camp. And Tad Williams actually straddles that really well. That's one of the things I like about him. And he's very respectful about, you know, having, I think, connections to both of those things. And he wears it, I think, very well. Yeah, but, I think he straddles it similar to the saddle at the Texas Roadhouse if it's your birthday. You know what I mean? That's I a very... No, you don't, because that's a really specific reference that three people will understand. But I thought it was <laughs> it went right over my head there. Yeah. Don't worry, it, it was a bad, it was a bad reference, but I had to get it out because I went to Texas Roadhouse last. I celebrated Father's Day. I went out, I took took you know uh, my my parents out, and uh, went to Texas Roadhouse where they will sit you on a saddle if it's your birthday. But they also line dance the entire time, and wow. I forgot about that, and I I realized I don't I don't like that. I, I I like the food. I don't like the entertainment. I uh, I'm good on line dancing, believe it or not. Ha. Huh. Yeah, I, I can't say I've ever been. I need to get out more, apparently. Alan got it. Alan, yeah, my Alan student did it last time we were there for a school thing. Yeah. All right. Philip, when you come visit, I'll take you to Texas Roadhouse. That's a, it's a date. We'll do I'm it. Gonna, we can get you chicken critters. They also have roadkill, which is like a flank steak with like mozzarella. And, and you and remember I'm a vegetarian, right? Yeah, we'll get your roadkill, and then uh, it'll be fine. It's tofu. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on one tonight. I, I told Philip, I drank my coffee a little bit late, so uh, I'm just kind of going for it. But I also, you know, whenever I bring on you or Alan and someone that's a close friend, it's always a, it's, a, it's easy. It's, it's easy to, to just kind of riff and go. Um, but I did want to ask you, because this week, was, there was something that came out this week. I don't think it was a Colleen Hoover book. I think it was the the prof. I can't remember. The Do prophet you, the was, prophet of Edan? Is that right? There it is. I was waiting for the product placement. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. The dragon. the dragon is awesome. I do love it, man. Um, so yeah, your second book came out, man. And uh, I know that you were given away the way of Edan last week. Uh, it was wow. last week, right? And yeah. uh, a bunch yeah. of people jumped on that, which is always exciting. But how are you feeling about the second book release? I feel fantastic. I really feel wonderful. Uh, there have been a few uh, reviews already, uh, some on Goodreads and uh, one in Grimdark Magazine. And, I saw that, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I'm really, really excited by the reception so far. And most people who have read it and have reached out to me have told me that they they like it even more than the first book uh so that's that's a good sign i think so i yeah. would definitely say that's a good sign it, it, was this release a little smoother because i know when the first one came the timetables weren't what you were promised and you were a little you know a little stressed yeah. out was this smoother it was it was smoother yeah i, I got, got the the physical book much sooner in comparison like everything the first time around it took 10 times longer than it was supposed to. This time, everything was like bang, 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 bang. It was like, I, I thought I, I, something had to go wrong, but actually, no, it all just sort of happened the way it was supposed to. So yeah, it was, it was actually a pleasant experience. Yeah. A pleasant experience. I mean, that's definitely different than the first one. So yeah, um, I guess you learned your lessons and maybe also got a little lucky uh, with the, with the publishing. I think it was more luck than me learning anything. <laughs> I'm a little slow, Jimmy. So I don't yeah. believe that for a second. Eh, well, yeah. So as far as book three goes, uh, yep. that's also coming out this year because you're a madman and uh, you're selfish uh, and you're hogging right. all these release windows. But where where are you at with book three? I mean, are are we in the editing process still? Are you wrapping it up? What's going on? Yeah, so I am right now more than halfway through with the editing formatting that I do. This I do the formatting. I, I work with Vellum, which makes everything really easy. But I'm doing a final read through of everything as I, I'm formatting it and uh, feeling great. I mean, I'm just probably a couple weeks left of that and I'm, I'll be done with my part. And then nice. the artist and the cover designer have to do their part. And I pretty pretty confident that uh, we'll get the third book out. So we'll have all three in one year. And it's really in my mind, all one story, 
And it's uh, in just in the simplest terms, the way of Edan book one is the departure and the prophet of Edan book two is the transcendence. And then the return to Edan is the return. So we'll have all three out and the story complete within the year, I hope. Did you ever consider about publishing it as one book? I, you know, I haven't looked into it thoroughly yet, but I am thinking about doing a special edition. And yeah. one thing that I don't know if it's feasible because of the length. Uh, so it might be too big to put in one book. And if so, fine. But one idea I had was to make it all one book as a special edition. If that doesn't work, they'll just all keep them, keep it a trilogy and put it out as a, a I think, I mean, I haven't, there's no deal or anything yet, but what I'd really like to do is to look into a special edition. Uh, after the third book is out, I'll probably start looking into that. So, so uh, you know, obviously you're kind of, the wheels are turning on this. Is this something that would be through one of the special edition publishers or Kickstarter? Okay, so it's, it's a publisher. Yeah. Okay. I, th yeah. I think, I mean, I haven't really, I mean, I'm open to uh, Kickstarter. I'm looking into different options, but I... I I definitely would love to work with something like the Broken Binding, for example, you know, one of those uh, presses that specialize in putting out these oh, yeah. beautiful, you know, special editions. So, yeah. There's been so many Broken Binding editions that have come out and I go, eh, I'm good. And then people start posting the pictures of what they've got. And I'm like, God yeah. damn, like, why didn't I get that? Uh, the Dandelion, I think it was Dandelion Dynasty. It was that them. I think it was them. They're beautiful. And then yeah. I have these mismatched covers because Saga Press hates me. Um, very, very depressing. <laughs> so, I, I think you would probably clean up pretty well on a Kickstarter, man. I think people would fund it. I think people would be excited about it. We'll see. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm very open to that. I think that would be fun. Um, so uh, I saw that product placement. Oh, the, you have, you made sure the doctor fantasy would get it now at Philip Chase. Etsy. I, don't, I don't have any merch, Jimmy. I have zero merch. Uh, well, other than my books, I guess, but yeah. Wait, why don't you have any merch? I don't know. I mean, I just, what would I, what would I sell? I mean, what would I handbags handbags with, with, with what Viagra? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> See, Philip, listen, we, we both have had milestones this week. Okay. You, you published your, you know, you're, you're living out your dream and publishing your second book. That's cool. But over on yeah, Bend the okay. Knee, my song yeah. of ice and fire podcast with my buddy, Matt, uh, we got sponsored by hymns, which is new age Viagra. So I got to do an ad read. No for Viagra. Way. So who's, who's really winning is my question. It's no contest, obviously. And, and, yeah. and I'm uh, hymns. If you're watching, where's my free samples? I haven't got them yet. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not even gonna touch that one jimmy <laughs> oh gosh this is the last time philip's gonna be on the channel he's a distinguished author now he has to he has to worry about the image <laughs> never mind the the professor side of things yeah <laughs> right right so yeah. speaking of being a professor are you uh are you i mean how how are things moving with the author kind of being able to maybe become more of a full-time thing like oh gosh yeah well it's not something you go into with the expectation that you can actually make a living from writing uh and i would have to be very lucky for it to ever get there at, at the oh gosh <laughs> i personally tested uh so it's it's wonderful i'm delighted with how it's going but i could never ever even dream of you know, I'm not even anywhere close to a point where I would be able to quit my day job and just write. Uh, that would be a dream. Absolutely. I'd love to. But it's something that I think is going to take years. And, and even then I would have to be lucky. So, yeah, I'm I'm happy to be able to do what I'm doing. Really, I feel like really I'm in a good place as far as that goes. And I do love teaching anyway. So I have a feeling that if I did get to a point where I thought, okay, yeah, I think I can make a go of it just writing. I probably would miss teaching too. So is there, could you do a part-time deal? You can, I mean, it's, there's a huge, I mean, I, you can always adjunct and that sort of thing. Uh, it's, you get paid by the class, but that's very low pay. I essentially would be doing it just to, to keep a hand in the classroom, you know? So, 
But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's very hard to make a go of it as a writer. Most books, like 99% of books do not make money. Yeah. It's, you, whether they're traditionally published or self-published, they just don't. You don't, most authors cannot make a living off of what they write. Uh, so that's the reality. But, yeah. uh, you know, I'm, I'm not doing it for money. That's for sure. If I were doing it for money, I'd be the world's biggest idiot because <laughs> I haven't, uh, if you look at the, the amount of time I put into it, it's not, it's, it would be like not even a penny, you know, uh, per per hour of labor. We're talking about 0. 0.000000 something right. cents per hour of labor. Yeah. So, I don't yeah. think anyone sets out to be a self-published fantasy author going, I'm going to get rich quick. Yeah, no, it's not the way to do it. Unless you're like somebody who's already got a big name and you're guaranteed, like I think Brandon Sanderson is a smart business guy because he figured out basically, hey, I could self-publish and I have loads of people who are going to buy whatever it is my name is on because they're my fans and he's right. So a person well, I'm sure business. then he gets he gets to barter with the publisher. Why, and should, I, why huge, should I resign with you? It gives him a huge bargaining chip. Yeah, so smart guy, kudos to him you know, for using that leverage, uh, you know, uh, but I'm not in that position. So yeah, not yet. Not yeah. yet. We'll see. Uh, books of Bengus Khan has a good question. And this is the, the, the follow up because, you know, you're publishing three books in a year, which is wild. And, you know, it is inconsiderate to me and my TBR, but that's fine. I'm, I'm forgiving you. Um, one a year, as Alan would say, um, you yep. know, it was supposed to be the year of Sanderson ended up being the year of chase, which is cool, but yeah, we're, we're competing. You're doing this. He doesn't know it yet, but we're competing. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I I believe in you. I think you can do it, man. I think hey. <laughs> you will beat him on Kindle Unlimited. There is no doubt in my mind on Kindle Unlimited, you will beat him. Oh, because he's not on it. Bingo. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> You're saying the quiet part out loud, Philip. I'm trying to give you a little shine here. And you thank know, you. Thank you just you. buried yourself. Yeah, I think uh, everybody in the chat knew that. But yeah. <laughs> They don't know. Um, so you're doing three books. Uh, it, it's a lot. And then there's going to be this big lull of not publishing a book, I assume. Or, well, it, or not, which is what Bing is kind of saying. New book, new series, new ideas. What do you got? I actually have a standalone sequel already written, which I am planning to publish in 2020. This year. 2024. Okay. I was... I'll give you a little break. I'll give you a little break. Yeah, I was going to I was going to rebel. I was going to go on strike from Philip Chase. I was going to unsubscribe. <laughs> um, so a stand. Uh, OK, so a sequel. Yeah, it's called Wild Darkness Gathers. OK, I really like that title. Yeah, I figured okay. you would. Yeah, yeah, I like that quite a bit. So are we talking and, and maybe you can't get into specifics, but are we talking like a big time jump? Or are we talking about right after? Because a lot of people don't go for the sequels. A lot of people go to the prequel after the big events. Right. Yeah. So curious 15 years after the trilogy 15 years i think that's a good number too yeah yeah i like that a lot so there's that and then i do have ideas for a prequel as well involving a character that you would have met already in book one so that is not something i've written yet but i just have kind of vague ideas right now so that would be for 2025 Okay, so we're not we're not leaving this world. You're 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 settling in. I like this world. I want to stay there for a while. Yeah. Okay, I like it, man. Uh, are is it going to be something where it's a continuation of what we're getting in the trilogy, or is it going to be kind of like because like uh, I was talking to Tad, and he said when he finished up Last King of Osar, that is like the main arc, but he's going to do like a Robin Hood type deal, which I th I think would be really cool in Ostenard. But it's like it's like a side thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, it's some characters who are in the trilogy will appear in the sequel. Um, so it, there are connections for sure, but it's a new story. So, okay. Uh, yeah. It's not a continuation of the trilogy. It's really a, a standalone. Yeah. So when you chose 15 years, was it a roll of the dice or? No, that's a very calculated number okay. because of various factors that I can't talk about. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. I don't want I don't want to get any slips or anything. You know, I don't want to get struck down by Chase Publishing Co., you know, <laughs> the YouTube right. strikes I keep hearing about. 
I just um, don't want to spoil things for anybody. So. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, I'm hoping to get your book read in July um, or early August. I know that for the first one we did an, an awesome conversation. You were there. Uh, maybe maybe you didn't want to be or you won't want to be for the second one because we, we kind of poked a lot of fun at you. But it was me. There was Alan. a little bit of roasting going on there. Oh, there definitely was. And, and awesome. you know, it, we were saying what we liked and what we didn't like. And we were giving it to you. But you, yeah. you of course, are always so gracious uh, whenever people give you any sort of feedback. So that discussion was a lot of fun. That was me, Joanna, Allen, and Murphy. Yeah. And uh, I'm hoping that we can get the band back together for that one. Um, but I think we're going to have to wait a little bit because you're going to be away for a, a while, right? Yeah, we'll, we'll be in Nepal for uh, a period in the summer. So, yeah, traveling back to see family and friends. So, nice. Yeah. What's your favorite thing to do in Nepal? Oh my goodness. I mean, uh, so many things. Uh, the food is fantastic. I love the, I love the, the landscape, the hiking, of course, trekking is a thing that a lot of tourists like to do over there. I like to go to the old cities that still have a lot of beautiful architecture that uh, is from you know hundreds of years ago. Uh, so there are cities there like Kathmandu itself is very modernized. There are obviously still parts of it here and there that you can visit that are that have older architecture. But there are some nearby cities like Bhaktapur, for example, where it's just this you feel like you're in like medieval Nepal and, and it's just so cool. Uh, and so I like going places like that. Um, yeah, lots to see there. Um, you know, we'll be also spending time in the south uh, near a uh, Chitwan National Park where there are elephants and tigers and rhinos and all kinds of cool stuff. So hopefully I don't get too close to a tiger. You know. Oh, I can't wait to see you on the Internet. <laughs> <laughs> Over the hill, Professor Mall. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, I hope that doesn't happen now because this will. Well, oh, then you'll feel good. guilty. Yes. Might be good for the channel, though. I don't know. <laughs> you mind taking one for the team, Philip? <laughs> I mean, I love you, Jimmy, but I don't know if I love you that much. Prove but... it. Prove it. <laughs> <laughs> Did Nepal ever inspire you in any of your uh, books? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I had a feeling. Oh, big time. Yeah. I mean, the whole, I think the magic system especially is something that I took from my, I, I do not claim to be an expert in Hinduism or Buddhism, but there's a lot of that in the magic system uh, in the world that I've created. And even a little, some influence on the culture and language of the Eastern kingdoms primarily, and also Astrolad. If, you know, if you've read the book, you know what that is, the island where Saquara is from. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, there, there are definitely some, uh, loose cultural and linguistic influences there as well. But in terms of the philosophy behind the magic, yeah, big time, I would say. Yeah. That's awesome. I mean, one of the things that I, I really did like about book one was the magic and also, um, your portrayal of religion. Um, you know, I think that, you know, there was times when my camera went out of focus, what is going on? See Bobby B's face sometimes will take over the focus. Oh, he'll do that. He's he's like I can't, I can't take him down. Like yeah. I can't. He's too much part of the part of the show. He likes um, taking over, doesn't he? Yes, he does. <laughs> um, I I, en I enjoy very much uh, the stuff you did with religion in book one, and I'm excited to see where you go with that in book two. Did you did you find a challenge? Like, did you find biases coming out at all, one way or the other, positive or negative, whenever you started writing about that, and like. How does one explore something that that's sensitive? Yeah, that's a good question. You mean religion, I guess. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. Um, I tried, even though I think it's fairly clear that I have some characters who are villains in the story uh, who are responsible for destruction and, and violence. And I have other characters who are trying to fight against that destruction and violence. So yeah, you could call them bad guys and good guys, I guess. Um, but I think I, th I would like to think that at least I've done a fair job of representing motives of the people who are responsible for the destruction in ways that are a little bit nuanced at least. And that 
yeah. where they believe that they are doing a good thing. And there have been plenty of examples of that in human history where people have perpetrated violence thinking they're in the right and that not only they're in the right, but they're divinely sanctioned. And I'm sure some of them really believe that, that they, that God is essentially telling them to do this. Right. Mm -hmm. So I hope that I explore that in a nuanced way. And I also, I, I believe represent this, uh, all the sides really, I hope uh, with their various religions, because there are four different religions uh, mm -hmm. going on in, in the story that there are good people and bad people who are adherents to each of the religions that yes. So the, the way there are people who are in positions of power in the hierarchy of the way who are perpetrating this holy war, but there are good people who are working within this religion who are living good lives and helping people and loving people. And then there are people in the other religions, and you'll see more of this in book two, I think, who are not exactly nice people, you know? So I hope I've been a bit nuanced about that. Um, but. Yeah, I thought so. I thought so. I mean, that was one of the things that, probably the thing that actually impressed me the most um, from the book and the thing that I wanted more of in book two. So with the name like The Prophet of Adan, uh, Dan, I feel like I, I hopefully will get some fulfillment on that front. Um, and... I'd like to see where you take it. And you did. You had more than one religion, which I think is good yeah. because there's so many books where it's like, this is it. And then maybe there's like a little bit of an outcast. You know, these people over here believe this, but it's never really well realized. But I felt like you made sure to to note that people had different beliefs in different parts of the world. And yeah. um, even the people who believe in the same religion actually believe differently, yeah. uh, which is very much real. <laughs> that is how the world works here on Earth. And um, yeah, I th thought it was excellent. Alan says in his version, Sequara is from Austria. Alan, if you make Sequara sound like Arnold Schwarzenegger, I'm going to have to come after you. Get to the prophet. It'll be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Mitch says, this is a little too nuanced for me. Tier rank religion. <laughs> Tier rank. I love it. I absolutely love it. We'll do a video tier ranking the religions. Yeah, I love it. Uh, Fit to be read asked having, by the way, Mike, how are you? Uh, having not read much fantasy is a Dan and it's easily accessible fantasy read for newbies or is there more of an on ramp better fit for those who've already read a lot of fantasy magic systems? Oh, well, I have no doubt, Mike, that you are more than smart enough to read that book. So yeah, I, I don't think you need in any way, shape or form to worry about, uh, uh, the uh, anything really. I mean, you, I, th I just hope you'd enjoy it. But uh, yeah, I, there's no preparation necessary. I think. What would you would you agree, Jimmy? What would you? What's your take on that? Yeah, I think if you had limited to no, I think this is a place that you could jump in. I mean, I do think some of the names and stuff could be difficult for someone if they're like completely like never heard of a secondary world, never played a video oh. game or anything. Then right. sure. But like, I'm going to assume there's at least some sort of like exposure uh so yeah i actually do i think it, it would be uh it would be a good place to start i don't think that it is like obviously you you took a lot of inspiration from um the classics right but yeah. Yeah. i think that you do a better job of questioning things about why they are the way they are instead of just taking them on the nose which right. I think is a better introduction to fantasy because I think when fantasy is at its strongest as like literature is, is whenever it's doing those things and putting that foot forward first. Um, so I actually would prefer to read something like that over something that is just like black and, you know, black, uh, black and white and not nuanced and also just, you know, the bad or bad and, and that that's it. So right. I, right. I do, I do think it's a, a good on ramp for sure. Yeah, well, yeah, and, and Mike is definitely as like a sci-fi, uh, you know, expert. He's used to weird names, I'm sure. So <laughs> that, that won't be a problem. Yeah. You know, speaking of like classics and older stuff, I had a comment on my Elric video, I think, my last review I did yeah. last week. And it, it was essentially saying, the person was saying, I'm glad that you're covering this. This is the older fantasy. It's a shame that you have to like preface things with, Hey, this is old, but it's still good. And uh -huh. 
and he brought up this comment and I th I think I agree with it. I don't know if it's true, but in my experience, it feels this way, at least in, in my everyday life is that it seems like the sci-fi and so I'm bringing this up because obviously fit to be read as a sci-fi channel. Um, sci-fi seems more willing to prop up the older works and like, you should start here and, and, this person was basically saying that they revere it and still recommend it. And those are like required reading. Whereas a lot of fantasy seems to be like, you know, you could read Lord of the Rings, but just go ahead and skip to 1990 and just forget everything uh -huh. in between. And do, do you find that to be true? Do you think that's, that's. I think we have a slightly skewed perception because of our community, which is wonderful. I love our community, but there is an emphasis in our community on the latest, the newest, because understandably people are trying to run channels and many of those people are interested in having those channels grow. And there is a tendency for YouTube to most social media to skew young. And so you're more likely to get more views if you do the latest, right? Whatever. That's, that's all the rage right now, as opposed to going back to something a bit older Right. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's probably part of it. Um, I don't know. That doesn't really completely answer your question, though, does it? Well, I, I, I think you're right. I, I think almost every opinion that I hold, I have to remember that it's through a lens of being here and being yeah. on YouTube talking about books and being a part of a community that is extremely niche. And that's OK. But I always try to take the bigger perspective. It's It's one of the things that I. I've been trying to do better at with my videos because, yeah. and I wonder if you've ever felt like this. Do you ever feel like you're like you're doing the uh, review or whatever video you're making it and, and you're making it for people who have already read the book or you know, that are going to read the book. Whereas what my, the challenge is, is I'm trying to get more people to read these books. I'm trying to get people who aren't reading fantasy to read these things. And yeah, you know, that, that's that's a tough balance because you want to be able to still put enough meat on the bone, you know, for somebody who's going to watch every single thing and has read everything to be able to watch and enjoy. But you, I mean, I don't know about you, but like part of my goal is I want more people to read fantasy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I can only speak for myself. And there are a couple things that I try to do with reviews. I'm definitely often trying to get people to read a book. Um, especially if I've enjoyed the book and I think it's worth reading and it's worth exploring. Uh, I also do a lot of long form discussion and that's definitely for people who have already read the book and, yeah. and want to have some company thinking about it, um, which is what I love. I really enjoy that. That's, that's kind of the main thing I'm here for, but I do try to put out reviews that um, hopefully will convince people to check out a book that I think they'll a certain type of reader will enjoy at least and mm -hmm. I, that's another thing that i think we often do in our reviews is say well if, if you're somebody who likes this sort of thing you know this this should really appeal to you so yeah try to relay things and that can also be tricky because you know saying something reminds you of a song of ice and fire one everyone's tired of hearing that but also like well what part of a song of it it's a massive thing like how you know what about that is is similar but the reason why I ask that is because like, that's a lens thing, right? Like we're in the community. We know a lot of our commenters, we know people are watching our videos. Um, and sometimes I have to remind myself that, you know, I also want to, Hey, person who isn't reading this, but maybe you saw this randomly. I, I would love for you to come also read this book and join the community. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's something I think, I've been thinking about a lot lately. I think what you, and you've gotten these comments, I'm sure many times, the, some of the comments that really keep us going, are when someone reaches out and said, Hey, you know, I checked this book out because of your recommendation and I loved oh. it. Thank you for, you know, getting me, you know, letting me know about this book. And that is one of the best things that we, we get to experience here. Isn't it? Yes. A hundred percent. And yeah. it's, it's, it's awesome whenever it crosses mediums as well. Cause like, I know you talk about manga. I do too. And I had, you know, I've had fans of manga who have never read and they come in and say, well, what, what can I read in fantasy? Like I want to get into this now. And I'm like, that's awesome. And I like it the other way too. I think that that's also always a, a great time. And uh, <laughs> David Sloan says, just I joining in. My Lord, I see Jimmy has only been ordering the triple beefcake burger for dinner. Hey man, I'm down almost 12 pounds. I'm feeling pretty good. Um, wow. Is that on purpose? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, uh, I always try to cut a little bit of weight around this time of the year. Um, also, jujitsu is infinitely easier whenever you're lighter. Uh, though it is really fun to be big and lay on people because they can't move. But, <laughs> but you know, if that doesn't work out, and then you're like a turtle on a shell, and you're like, I can't get up. I should eat the cheeseburger. Oh no, you wouldn't know because you don't eat cheeseburgers. I don't eat cheeseburgers. You eat like right. cucumbers and banana peels or something. I don't know. <laughs> well, not the peels, but yeah. But the bananas. Well, that seems wasteful. Uh, <laughs> um, someone had a good question, and I need to find it. I think it was Bengus Khan. Oh, yes. He said, just curious on the behind the scenes, is Philip heavily involved with consulting on the audiobook? Well, I don't think Alan would mind uh, me saying that basically the extent of my involvement so far has been just one meeting where I helped him with a bunch of pronunciations and that's about it. Really. I'm, I'm, it's kind of like a hands-off kind of guy, I guess. So I, I have so much confidence that Alan's going to do a brilliant job when he gets going and I am just excited to see what he comes up with. So I want him to have creative freedom. I do. I really do because I think you, Alan's the type of person, I hope Alan agrees, who thrives with creative freedom. So I think he's going to do some really fun stuff, some stuff that I won't even be able to anticipate. And I'll be all on board, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, I think he is going to try out some voices on me pretty soon. And so I'll get to hear his Day Raven, who hopefully will not actually sound like Pinocchio. We'll see. <laughs> I hope he does. <laughs> I'm just so curious to see the voices because you hear about authors who say, like, I never imagined his character sounding like this, but now that is that character's voice. The famous one is Eddie Dean and yeah. Frank Muller and Stephen King. And yeah. I'm just curious to see if that happens to you. Like, maybe you'll see your character in a different light, uh, which would be really interesting. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure Alan's interpretation will be, will be really cool. You know, mm -hmm. I'm really looking forward to that. And I really hope that in his case, this leads to more of this sort of thing. Cause I think he's very talented and he's going to be really good at this. So yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, so for his sake, uh, I hope this is a huge success. So. Yes. I am also always impressed by Alan's array of talents, to be honest with you. Um, we yep. just filmed a pacing discussion that's going to be on Joanna's channel. So be on the lookout for that. It was me, Alan, Joanna and Murphy. And uh <laughs> Cool. He just started busting out the the stoner impersonations, and uh, it's so spot on. It's so impressive. I love it. <laughs> I'm gonna read stoner this summer. So yeah, we told Murphy she should just read it with you. Yeah, actually, she she reached out to me, so we we might have a discussion on it um, after I get back from my travels. So yeah, you know, if you don't include Alan, he's gonna throw a holy war. <laughs> <laughs> I've been thinking about rereading it because ever since I read uh, the death of uh, Ivan Ilyich, is that how you say Ilyich? I would say Ivan Ilyich, but uh, Ivan I don't Ilyich? don't trust me because I have no Russian knowledge. I need, of Russian I need Nick in, in the chat, my buddy Nick. I mean, I'm pretty sure it's Ivan, not Ivan, but you know, I don't know. I just think of like, oh, there's a bunch of wrestlers in the 80s named Ivan. So anyways, so I read that and I feel like Stoner is very much like an homage to that story in a lot of ways. And it has a little bit more stuff to it. Stoner is a full book, right? Whereas the death of even say it one more time. Well, I, I again, please don't quote me. I, I, I just say Ivan Ilich, but uh, Ivan Ilich, yeah. um, you know, that that's a short story and a beautiful well, one. Like, it's kind of a novella almost. It's a long short story. I think today would be considered a novella. They call it a short story in a lot of, a lot of the collections. And then some yeah. of them are like that featuring other short stories. Um, but I really feel like stoner is like the next step of that. Um, though I like death more than stoner, to be honest. Um, uh -huh. I'm going to be doing a video actually. And we, <laughs> it's really interesting that Shad brought this up randomly, but he said, Philip, have you read any classic Russian literature? It's sort of a random question, but I've randomly gotten into Russian literature this past month or two. And, um, uh -huh. I'd love to hear what you've read. Oh, well, I, I mean, a, a bit here and there. I've read um, some Dostoevsky, so Crime and Punishment, uh, a little bit of Tolstoy, a little bit of just this and that. I wouldn't consider myself uh, past Boris Pasternak. Uh, so, yeah, I've, I've just uh, dabbled, really, and have enjoyed what I've read. Although I will say, 
Crime and Punishment left me depressed for probably two weeks after I read it. But uh, oh, it that is, sounds fantastic. Had a huge impact on me. Yeah, when I read it. Yeah. So my uh, my beginnings was I bought uh, the Brothers Karamazov. I'm probably saying it wrong. Um, probably last year, and I planned on that being one of the big reads for like classic literature this year. And I started it and I was like, I need to start with something smaller from Dostoevsky. So I ended up getting uh, crime and punishment and I have started that. Um, Virginia Woolf was not a fan of Dostoevsky. She said it was like everyone sitting in a, in a room screaming their most inner thoughts out loud at each other. And I, <laughs> I'm not saying I don't like it, but I will say I think that is one of the most, at least the brothers. I feel like that is exactly what it felt like when I first started it. And I was like, wow, she nailed it. Um, but I also started Tolstoy and I'm reading through Anna Karenina right now. And okay. I'm very much enjoying it. Like I'm only, I'm only 80 pages in. I'm reading it very slowly. Like I said, I, I picked up like crime and punishment in this, like, what am I doing? Like what? It's the fantasy network, not the Russian literature network. It doesn't, it doesn't, this doesn't, this is not conducive, right? Um, but Tolstoy, I've probably read seven of his short stories this month. Oh, wow. The death of even Ilyich. And, yep. and I, I think he's going to end up being one of my favorite authors. Like I, I, I would probably put him in a top 10 right now. I really do. I think so. Wow. Just based on his short fiction. And then the beginning of Anna Karenina is, uh, whew, it's good. It's very good. Have you read that? No, no, I haven't read that one. No. My plan is to read that and then move to um, um, War and Peace. Okay, yeah. that's good. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, I, I, I would love to be able to read them in Russian too. That would be awesome uh, because, of course, I would only be able to read a, an English translation. But um, and I, I always feel a little bit like reading a translation i'm not actually reading the book i'm missing a ton of stuff and maybe some stuff has been added and that sort of thing well i'm the sort of person who worries about that uh needlessly probably well it, it you already have like the analysis paralysis of picking the works because like even crime and punishment which is significantly shorter than brothers is not short and no. it's dense it's very very dense so then you have to worry about the translations and i also worry about that and then it's also hard to evaluate prose uh, that way, right? Like the writing, it's, it's hard to really say I am speaking on this because you know, you know what I'm saying? Oh, um, absolutely. You, you, I think it's almost impossible for you to duplicate the nuance that exists in the, the original language in the mm -hmm. same way. I just don't think it's something, even the greatest, most gifted translators can't do it. It's just the, the languages are too different. You know, there are certain words in Russian that might have multiple connotations that just don't exist with the nearest equivalent English word. And so you're missing a lot of that. It's just, it's a huge, if you've ever tried translating something, it is almost paralyzing how you have to make this decision between, am I going to try to be faithful to the meaning or am I going to try to duplicate the aesthetics of the uh, original? And you can't do both. You cannot do both. The That's closer right. you get to one side, the further you get away from the other side. And so it's just a kind of a, it's fun. It's like a big puzzle in, in my experience. Most of my translating, by the way, has been from old English to modern English. Right. Uh, but uh, I've also done a little bit of translating from French and German, which I'm not that good at, but, um, but certainly with, with old English, I can speak with some nuance about what is lost and, and what is gained in the translation. Yeah. Yeah. And th there's certain things that, that do come across. Uh, like for instance, one of the effects that Tolstoy goes for with the death of even Ilyich is that the the story is about the death of someone so you already know what's going to happen and i mean it's in the title and as we move to the final <laughs> scene of and how he gets there the the sentences and the chapters get shorter yeah. to, and this works to great effect because this is a story that should not be a page turner at all and it was um right. Philip, I'm not kidding you when I tell you, I think that story is the most impactful story I've ever read in my entire life. Like nothing has ever affected me like that ever. Interesting. Um, it, it hit. So my grandma passed away um, right when I was reading it. 
And oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it, she was 92. Wonderful woman. Shout okay. out to grandma. Um, and uh, she, uh, so she passed. And then I, re- I was reading this on the plane. I had tears in my eyes, like, uh, you know, tears rolling down my cheeks on the plane. Just And not because I, I love this character so much and I was so attached to him. No, right. he frustrated me. In some ways I hated him. Um, but, you know, the, I don't know. There's something about the way that he connected death to everyone that I just found to be really moving. I'm, I'm hoping to make a video about it, a very short video, yeah. just about, I'm going to try to articulate why I feel like it impacted me so much. And I've, I've tried to write down a few paragraphs about it. And every single time it's really tough for me to do because when you have something that talks at that level, and that intimacy of something like your mortality, I think it's almost impossible not to expose some of yourself. And that's a very difficult thing to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, yeah. I just, I, go ahead. I was just, I just think it's like maybe the best thing I've ever read. Like it's so good. It's a great story. I really love it. Uh, another one. I don't know if you're looking for more of this sort of thing, but uh, another one that I really love is called the jilting of granny Weatherall by Catherine Ann Porter. Hmm. It's also, it's much shorter than the death of Ivan Illich, um, but it is a similar kind of thing going on in the story. It's called The Jilting of Granny Weatherall. Uh, and Catherine Ann Porter, in my mind, captures, and I, no, I've never died before, obviously, that I know of. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know exactly what it's like, but I have been near loved ones who have passed away. And particularly when they're older, there is a sense of them being in and out of, you know, sometimes they, they feel like they're very present and other times they're somewhere else. And, you know, there's just this sort of wandering that's going on there near the end. And Catherine Ann Porter just, in my mind, captures that magnificently. And there's this wonderful way in which she, she totally just breaks every rule about, uh, point of view in there so she has she switches constantly between first and third person narration for example and you had this you're just totally confused about what's going on just like the character who's going through her i mean i I already sort of gave it away but yeah she's this is a woman who is dying uh, essentially it's a fascinating short story um uh, well you you sold me i i have it pulled up on my amazon so (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Congrats. You got me. Um, yeah. I'm always, um, always down to read stories um, about mortality and death. Library Ladder says, in my experience, Penguin classics tend to have the best English translations. Avoid any edition that uses translation in the public domain more than 100 years old. Uh, I've been doing Tolstoy Penguin classics, except for Anna Karenina. I'm doing um, uh, Oxford classic, which I might be public domain. It hasn't been bad, um, but Maggie Gyllenhaal does the... Oh. Uh, she does the audiobook on Audible, and I think it's free on Audible, and it is fantastic. Though I tried wow. to do immersion reading, and I was like, "Oh, these are two different translations; <laughs> they're not saying the same thing." <laughs> um, I actually think the audiobook one might have been slightly better, but neither were bad, in my opinion. Also, shout out to Library Ladder; uh, had a great episode with him a couple weeks back. Yeah, that was a great episode. Yeah, yeah. one of uh, one of the fastest uh, growing episodes I've ever done. So I think people really enjoyed that, and we talked a lot about older fantasy and publishing. And we're going to be doing another episode here in the future uh, where we really go into building out a TBR, including things that isn't Tolkien and, you know, before the wheel of time and everything else. So if you ever want to talk about William Morris, I wrote my dissertation on him. So, you know, nice. Okay. Look at this. Tolkien was very much inspired by William Morris without William Morris. We would never had, we'd never would have had Tolkien. Well, now I feel like I need to learn more. <laughs> um, Kai says, which translation of the death of even Ilias? I, I just don't even want to say it. Um, that's why I can't make the video. Did you read, Jimmy? I did the Penguin Classics uh, one. It comes with a bunch of other short stories. I read all of those, and then I read a few other short stories, and I literally liked every single one of them. Like, I would give every one of them four or five stars. Uh, really, really enjoyed that, so... I'm glad I got to shove in some Russian literature here because I'm honestly thinking in July, like that's going to be the bulk of my reading. So it's pretty, cool. pretty exciting. Uh, we had a, I'm sorry, bookmarks with Jay said, I'm currently switching back and forth between uh, Adan and Elric. Such a great combination. I like that. Cool. I love it. Yeah. Love it. Thank you, and Jason. 
Yes. And we also had Beth when we were talking about older fantasy. Uh, Beth says, I think we're doing a good job with Martin, Hobb, and a few others. Would love to see more attention on Kurtz, Hambly, Saberhagen, Lieber, and some others. Yeah. And Kurtz is one I was actually in my notes whenever I had a library ladder on. It was one I really wanted to highlight because I've been so interested in her work for so long. And I just never seem to get around to it. Um, have you read any Kurtz? No. Okay. I don't feel so bad now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I, I have so many gaps in my fantasy reading and uh, I'm sure everyone does, but yeah. there are so many writers that, some I probably haven't even heard of yet. Um, but yeah, they're just, I have so much catching up to do and I will never ever be able to read every fantasy author that I feel like I have to get to. Um, mm -hmm. But um, that's how it is. And that's a good problem, I think, right? Isn't it? I mean, it keeps, keeps us motivated, keeps us happy. That's why like, I hate when I go through times where ever, like I don't, like I'm not feeling the need to burn through 200 pages a day because I'm like, so much stuff I want to get to. It's almost overwhelming yeah. at times. Yeah, I don't want to feel like this is stressful ever, but yeah, we're doing this for fun, right? Yeah. So I don't want to feel guilty or awful because I haven't read this author and this author, this author. So I'm a fake fan or something, right? <laughs> um, right? So I just feel like there are so many great authors out there to try and that's a wonderful thing and I'm going to enjoy the moment. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think that's the best attitude to have towards it. We talked a little bit earlier about people who were, you know, maybe coming from manga to reading or reading to, well, it's both reading, but books, fantasy books. And shout out to Clubs163 said, that's me. I just started Prince of Nothing and I'm absolutely loving it. Kellis's perspective is so alien. I'm really glad that you're enjoying it. I think uh, Clubs, I think you were either a One Piece viewer or a Berserk viewer, if I remember correctly. So or both. I think you were both. Uh, so I'm excited that you're trying Prince of Nothing. That's a dense one to get into. If you can read that, you can awesome. read. Yeah. Yeah. You can read just about anything. And Kellis is one of the most unique perspectives in all of fantasy, in my opinion. That is so, definitely okay. not fantasy 101. No, it's that's that's up there, I would say. That'd be yeah. low on the iceberg. Uh, David Sloan had a good question, and I want to ask you this, Philip, because you're in a unique position, um, you know, being a reviewer, but also an author. Uh, he says, are either of you too scared of learning too much about the craft of writing and that knowing what's behind the curtain can take away from what's on the stage? I, I, I just naturally like to know how things work. It's how I've always been. And the nice thing for me, and it's not Philip, <laughs> Philip can't do this, but I can just say, I don't care any, I don't care for this month. I'm just going to read whatever and not worry about this thing. Sometimes I read things very closely. Sometimes I read, you know, and I'm just breezing through it and having a great time. Uh, Philip, I feel like you have to be concerned about the craft most times, right? Oh gosh. Yeah. I mean, it, it does. I think writing does change the way you read and mm -hmm. it's for both good and ill. You know, I think it, it can make it a little bit harder to allow yourself to be immersed in the story because you're constantly looking at, Oh, look at that sentence. That's an interesting construction, you know, and you, and you when you're doing that, you're stopping the story essentially. And you're going back and reading. So that's a, that's a great thing too, though, because you're enjoying the beauty of that sentence. Uh, so yeah. that's, that's also a pleasure. So I think you replace some pleasures with others a little bit, but, and it, and not that you can't, uh, I mean, you can section off different parts of your brain, turn off your writer brain for a bit and immerse yourself in a story where you're just enjoying the moment, I think. Um, but it, it does become, I think, a slightly different experience. The more you write, uh, at least that's how I've experienced it. Uh, you, you tend to, you tend to read differently. I actually probably read more slowly. Uh, oh, yeah, because, I yeah, I mean, I'm a slow reader and I, I tend to uh, read a lot less than probably the average booktuber, I would guess, uh, for, for the channel anyway. Um, so it's just that I want to ingest this and think about it and uh, be able to be in a discussion about it and say things about it. So I tend to be a, probably on the slower end, I think. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, I read The Art of Fiction by John Gardner, which you recommended to me about a, maybe two years ago now. And, yeah. Is uh, it the first time I came here? No. Uh, you recommended it to me in Orlando when we were having breakfast together. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And my God, that book 
is single singly the the best writing advice book I've ever read. But also as as someone who does look at writing when I do reviews, oh man, I learned so much. <laughs> I learned so much. It, it that it's crazy uh, how much information is in that book, and it had me think about. Uh, a lot of different things. And I noticed I was reading very slowly after that, but I also recommend it to uh, one of my friends who's writing and writing a book. And she went back through her draft and she said, Oh my God, <laughs> I have to change everything. <laughs> and, but she, you know, she came out and I told her, I said, you know, this is, this is great because now it's going to be better. You know, this is stuff that you maybe would have never caught. And I think that she also really enjoyed the book and it's helping her out. Uh, with her stuff. So fantastic. Super yeah. proud of her and also just super excited because whenever you have more information, you know, you're, you're empowered. You you can make better decisions when you're writing. And also when I'm reading, I can see now why I feel a certain way when I read something. Um, I was yeah. reading wise man's fear whenever I was reading art, of, art of uh, fiction. Uh -huh. And I was like, Oh, <laughs> I see all these unstressed syllables and the flow of the sentences. And you're just like, okay, I get it now. I'm starting to see why, even though this isn't purple, it still flows and has almost a rhythm to it. Um, and that book definitely enabled me to be able to see that. So I highly recommend anyone who is interested in the craft, even if you're not a writer and you're a reviewer, check out the art of fiction uh, by John Gardner. It's okay. short and fantastic. I mean, it's just terrific. Yeah. So I think it's the gold standard when it comes to writing advice and it, maybe it's a little dated, but I, I think there's plenty of great stuff in there. So. Yeah. And even take shots at some of the legends. Like he, he actually, you know, has critiques of Tolstoy, Dostoevsky. Um, I know from what I read that he's not a big McCarthy fan, which I thought was interesting. Uh -huh. um, yeah. he, he wasn't the biggest fan of him. Uh, so, you know, there's also, it's opinions, but I think there's solid advice in that book that could put people on the right path. I mean, I felt empowered after that. So um, definitely highly, highly recommend. Mr. Panther 54 asked, Jimmy, have either of you read Infinite Jest? I have not, and I don't think Philip has either. Yeah. No. Um, and then Paul, what's up, Paul, said, were you guys aware that Best Serve Cole is getting out of adaptation? I, I am aware. And uh, I'm, 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 I'm uh, not quite that much of a hermit. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got the rabbit ears out did you pull out the old tube tv <laughs> there have there have been references to this uh all over the place so yeah we we've heard yeah i'm I, i'm excited because uh joe abercrombie is doing the screenplay i believe so he is yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, he's actually worked in TV before. So this isn't like him making this big experiment. He's, he's written for uh, TV quite a few times. And I think, I think it has a really high ceiling, a very, very high ceiling. I think a revenge tale is something people can get behind. I mean, kill bill was wildly successful. Best serve cold is kind of his version of kill bill in a lot of ways. Oh, um, absolutely. Yeah. And the talent that they're talking about getting for the, sh uh, for the movie is, is impressive. So this oh, doesn't I think it's going to be great. I'm very optimistic, but We'll this see. might blow the roof off this thing, man. Yeah. Yeah. I hope it succeeds. I mean, I, first of all, I, I'm a huge fan of Abercrombie's uh, books. So I hope it succeeds for that, but also just for fantasy in general, we need a win. I think we need a, an unambiguously great fantasy screen production because there've been some that have definitely been mixed. I think recently nobody's quite had that success that, uh, Game of Thrones had, uh, I don't think even the House of Dragons was as big as Game of Thrones, right? It's the biggest but, thing HBO has had since, numbers-wise. Okay. But it, 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 it well, I, there, was a, there was a point in season one that it was sniffing season six numbers, okay. which, is, which is honestly insane. But no, one, no one's come close to season eight. Like, I think Stranger Things is the only thing that was in the ballpark, and it still isn't close. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. So we, we, we're due for a, a big un unambiguous win and uh, I'm definitely pulling for Abercrombie's uh, great success in this endeavor. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's good for everybody, but also I'm just a big fan and I think it's actually the best place to start. I think it's a really, and you know, I know there's concerns about like, well, it might spoil things for the first, like, let's just get this one out and they can figure it's an adaptation. They can change a lot of stuff. Um, you know, it could end up being a prequel to a trilogy. <laughs> like who, who knows? Maybe they only do Age of Madness. Maybe they don't do the first trilogy. It, it could be uh, many, many things. So I am excited about it. Abercrombie's clearly on board. So why shouldn't I be? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Uh, there was a question here from Escape the Book. It says, any recommendations for reviewing books? I've been doing spoiler-free reviews, but they're so small. Philip, what do you think? Well, spoiler-free, if you want a bigger audience, is definitely the way to go. Because if you do talk spoilers, you've just shrunk your, your audience tremendously right there. So in my experience, spoiler-free reviews do better than those with spoilers. However, no reviews are really doing great these days on, on YouTube numbers wise, at least in the, in the short term. I think we talk about the long game sometimes and your reviews are going to have value for years and years and years. Whereas your, you know, TBR video, not so much. Right. So mm -hmm. I think uh, you're doing the right thing by making the spoiler free um, and what I can only say what I do, which is I tend to focus on what I try to divide it up into different parts. So I'll talk about the characters in ways that are not, that's a tough one to talk about in a non-spoiler way, but you can talk about the setting. You can talk about the themes. You can talk about symbols. You can talk about all these different aspects of storytelling, um, and give people a sense of what the story is about without spoiling any of it. That's what I try to do in my reviews. Um, but, uh, it's, it's hard these days, I think, to attract an audience doing reviews, at least immediately. So I don't know. What do you think, Jimmy? Yeah, I mean, the big thing is, is just to remember that you're always talking. Just pretend you're talking to someone brand new every single time. So even if you have to repeat things about uh, your taste preferences or whatever, uh, there will be people who watch every video you do and they will get tired of hearing you say thing ad nauseum and they'll make bingo cards like my audience is made for these. But you have to remember <laughs> that that you know the people who are going to watch every single video are you know dedicated they're awesome but there are going to be a lot more people who probably have never seen you uh whenever that thing pops up on their youtube page so i always tell people don't be afraid to repeat yourself in reviews and never take anything for granted as far as information goes uh you might use a term like pacing and say well the pacing was bad but like we you know i think i think a good review unpacks that and dives into it a little bit more and that th those are the the biggest challenges when it comes to reviewing books, but those are for me also the most interesting points of it. Um, the best, one of the best reviews I've ever seen, and I'm, I'm not blowing smoke up his rear end here, but Alan's black company review, hmm. uh, which I think is his first review ever on his channel is one of the best book reviews I've ever watched. I love that video so much. I read the book, loved it. I watched Alan's review. I loved it more. And that is, that's great. awesome. Yeah. And I think that a lot of people would probably watch that and also be fired up about it. So I think that that's a really good template uh, to go and check out. And, you know, it was one of Alan's, I think it was his first review. And so you can see, you know, that's someone starting out and someone who had a passion for a book and wanted to talk about it. Also, you don't have to review every book you read. Uh, review what you want to read, whether it's good or bad. But people can tell when you don't want to talk about a book. Like, it's obvious uh, for me. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of bingo cards, yours must be almost full by now. I think. You, yeah. You I got to get some news. You <laughs> did a song of ice and fire. I uh, think, right. Ask dairy. She must know. I think I mentioned jujitsu. Oh, uh, you definitely mentioned jujitsu. I, I said, R. Scott Baker. R. You Scott can put Baker. Tolstoy on there now. Cause I know I'm going to reference that like a thousand. <laughs> let, let me ask you this, uh, Philip. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I asked you this last time you were on because your book had not came out yet. You had just hit 20 K subs. We were celebrating that. We were talking about how you're about to become an author. So now you are an author and yeah. you've been doing reviews and videos and discussions and all this crazy stuff for years. And that's how a lot of people know you. And now you're an author and people that you have known are reviewing your books. Yeah. And some are saying good things. Some are saying, you know, Hey, I would like this to be better or whatnot. You know, there, there's an array of things. Very positive though. How do you look at reviews now and has it changed since you become an author? I don't think I've changed. I mean, I, I had a philosophy that I've talked about with you before about reviewing and, and I am not at all saying that other people need to do it the way I do it. I'm fine with other people having their own style, but the way I do reviews has always been, I'm imagining the author is in me in the room with me and I am saying what I would say to that person to their face, because mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to say something in a video that I wouldn't say to a person's face. And so I do try to keep any criticisms I have respectful and constructive and that sort of thing. That's just how I, that's how I do it. Uh, so 
obviously I understand that every other people have a different way of, of doing reviews. So I, to be honest with you, I haven't, I mean, I, I appreciate deeply appreciate somebody going through the trouble of writing a review of my book. That's fantastic. Especially if it's a nice review, of course, uh, you know, I appreciate that a ton. Uh, so, but I try not to be, to, to make my mental state dependent on whether someone likes what I'm doing or hates what I'm doing, because that's a, that's a, uh, a roller coaster. I don't care to get on, you know, I, if I'm, I'm giving that power to other people to either make me happy or make me sad. You know, I, I don't think I want to do that. So I just try to be level headed, I guess, about reviews. And uh, I, I have chosen not to engage on YouTube, at least uh, when somebody does a review of my books, because I want to give people space to feel free to say what they want. Um, I don't want to be, you know, invasive in any way. And some people are like, ah, you could comment on my channel. I don't care. And that's fine. But um, I just want to make sure people feel comfortable. So, uh, and because it is, I guess you could say it could be awkward sometimes if, uh, you know, a friend of mine reviews the book and I come in there on their, on the video making comments, you know, that, that could squelch conversation, I think. So, so yeah, I guess my philosophy about reviews hasn't changed. I have had to figure out how I want to deal with reviews as an author though. And that's new. And basically I've been trying to be level-headed about it to be uh, fine with whatever people have to say because that's their experience, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's their experience. That's their reading experience. Who am I to say they're wrong or right? Obviously I feel nicer if somebody liked the book and says nice things but most people have you know things they like and things that they they thought could be better and that sort of thing and that's great yeah. that's wonderful you know you put a lot of time into this thing and i imagine i i, I know i know it's hard because yeah. you know uh, people had things to say whenever i did my performances back in the day and uh they sure. weren't always nice that's and analogous yeah and i'll tell you what <laughs> you're a bigger man than i am because i was like 22 in a hothead i did not enjoy those those uh oh, well i'm an older man than you are I'm very old yes yeah so <laughs> um i'm only kidding um but you have done so much research and you're studied you're intelligent um you you took time with this thing you worked on it for a very long time that's true is there any piece of you that gets maybe slightly discouraged whenever you maybe come across a review or you hear something about the book and they, they maybe missed all of the reference? Because I know there's a ton of old English stuff in there and that I don't get. Like literally, I'm, I feel bad because I know how much work you put into this thing. Right. Philip, I don't know any of those things. Like I don't know. And I can't help it unless <laughs> I'm going to go and, and start, which maybe I should, but – do you know what I'm saying? Like when someone actually is it, maybe positively, if someone's able to appreciate those things and go, Oh, I see what he's doing here. Yeah. Like, does that not just make your world light up? I love it when people understand, but the vast majority of my audience is not fluent in old Norse or old English. And so those references were pretty much for my own pleasure. And if I wrote a book that, people wouldn't enjoy it unless they understood the old English references, then that's not probably a very good book. So uh, it's fine. There are people like Mick Scarfield is there in the chat and Mick Scarfield is somebody who's interested in that sort of thing. So he'll leave these fantastic comments about etymology and, Oh, I see what you're doing with this name. That's a reference to this or that. And that I love that. I just absolutely love that uh, kind of comment, but most people aren't interested in that. They're interested in a good story. So that's, the primary thing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, I have definitely inserted things in there other than linguistic references and stuff like that. You know, I have these stories within the story. I have some people don't, for some reason, I can't figure out why, but some people don't like poetry in their fantasy. Uh, it's just a thing, I guess. Right. Some people actually skip the poems. Did you know that Jimmy? I, I did because I did. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I read every word you pinned. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, and those for me are look, look, at what am I doing here with this? I'm not just putting in a poem because I think it's cute. I'm putting it in because 
it's related thematically to what I'm doing in the larger story. And I'm exploring another facet of this theme through this story within the story. If you don't care for that though, hopefully the main story is still compelling. So yeah, but yeah, that's, that's uh, something I'm doing. And I don't know how many people are actually thinking about that. Like, Oh, how does this relate to the bigger story? But Certainly some people are, and uh, I love it. When I get those comments, it's really gratifying. So Yeah, very cool. So, you, you know, you are hearing some feedback, getting some feedback, people sharing their thoughts with you um, in various ways. Uh, you, you are editing these books. Like book one came out, you edited book two, and we're finishing it up, and now you're finishing up book three. Has any feedback that you've had from book one made it to book two or three? Um... Feedback post publishing book one. Post, you mean. post publishing book one. Like you heard public opinion of something and you said, oh, that's interesting. I don't, th I can't think of anything specific, uh, it, but that doesn't mean that it hasn't happened because as I sit down and edit book two and it's, it's sit down, now I'm doing book three, it's possible that I move a chapter and in a, in a, just nudge a chapter in a little bit of a direction based on feedback um but you know i don't i can't think of a specific thing a lot of people complained about the use of the word curdle in the first book <laughs> no no you said curdle to me <laughs> i did a kindle search i was like what in the world does this word even mean i mean i thought people would appreciate learning and uh about curdles it's your ochre yeah it's my ochre it's my yeah. ochre yeah for sure um so you know I don't think I sat down and said, oh, I better delete these uses of, of curdle and, and replace it with tunic instead or something, right? I don't think I went through it and did that. But interestingly, though, I do have the word tunic in there as well. And I use that when it, it's coming from a certain culture, whereas the Old English-based culture, they use the word curdle because that word comes from Old English. So anyway, I thought that made sense, but... Yeah. So, so you would say that it would be subconsciously if anything at all, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I look, I, I got tons of feedback, um, as I was writing these stories and, uh, two people especially really helped me. I think a lot. One was the, my agent, uh, back when I was trying to go the traditional route, I did have an agent who was a real agent. I mean, he was fantastic. When I say real agent, I mean, he, worked with me to help me make the stories better um, and gave me some really great feedback that I, I took to heart. Um, so the other was AP Canavan from a critical dragon. Uh, so he was my developmental editor and gave me some wonderful feedback. And I'm really excited to talk about little pieces of the story that I think he really helped me to make even better. So, yeah. Uh, so I've taken, plenty of uh of advice into consideration change things uh many many times so at this point i feel like i'm kind of committed and the story yeah. is what it is yeah um so this is one of the things i wanted to ask you um i've been you know giving you a hard time about releasing three books in a year but yeah. after book one was there any piece of you that said i kind of wish i had a little more time between these so i could maybe change a couple things or, or gauge the feedback at all. And I know that not all feedback is worthy of action. I understand that. Obviously. Oh, that's, the, that's the thing. Uh, you'll tell, you'll have people tell you, I want more of this. And other people will say, no, I want less of this. Of and course, you, yeah. you get all of this like contradictory <laughs> feedback from all over the place. So it's almost impossible to listen yeah. to all the voices um, mm -hmm. Not that I have, you know, you, you respectfully listen, but in the end, I think you have to pick a few people that you really trust, unless there's some consensus, unless, you, you know, 99 out of 100 readers tell you, I don't like this thing, then yeah, that's something you should look at for sure. Yeah. But for the most part, I, you, you can't please every single reader out there, first of all. And I think you do have to have a, a small circle of trusted readers, hopefully a professional editor uh, whom you listen to very closely. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, that, that, that's the same thing with an editor, right? They might think that you need to take something out. I know another self-published author 
who had editors, beta readers, and had one that felt very strongly about one thing and told them to take it out. And they ended up not taking it out and it ended up being the biggest hit of the book. So yeah. it, it, it's tough. And, you know, that was, that was someone who was being paid to, to make these kind of decisions possibly. So uh, I, I don't think yeah. it was beta reader. I think it was an editor possibly. I might be getting those flipped, but either way it, it, that, that begins all the way back at the developmental process. It's hard to figure out exactly what you should be listening to. When do you, when do you trust your gut? Um, yep. I know Erickson said he, uh, eventually the editors just leave you alone because <laughs> they're tired of fighting with you. Hell with it. Finish it up, <laughs> whatever. You know, <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, yeah. I could see him standing his ground for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think he knows a thing or two. I think he knows a little bit about writing. Yeah. Just yeah. a smidge. He, uh, I, someone had said that maybe he was on Facebook. He said that he would be releasing his memoirs on writing this year, possibly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I mean, hmm. I know I haven't heard uh, any details uh, about mm -hmm. when that might be coming out. Yeah. This is hearsay. It might be next year. I might be getting it wrong, but yeah, I mean, we knew he was, I'm he was, for it. That. I'm excited for it. Uh, for Very sure. But, yeah. Yeah. I could uh, listen to that man talk about writing all day long. Well, he, he and AP have made some fantastic videos that i have referred to as a master class and they're very adamant that no this is not a master class um but if you look at their videos on writing there's an awful lot to learn um from their observations yeah mm -hmm. For so sure. i have a feeling a slightly more like organized book on the topic is going to be really really fantastic yeah and it will definitely be a resource for you know up and coming writers i'm sure um Oh, here we go. A Amy uh, says Erickson said he might get the book done by December, but I believe they didn't make it a promise. Yeah, yeah, no set dates, but I just know that it was coming along, um, which is which is right. definitely really exciting. Speaking of coming along, did, you read Jade War? Have you finished Jade War yet? Are we ever talking about that book? Or I, I think so. Eventually, yeah. I mean, I actually stopped reading it. I'm two thirds of the way through. I stopped reading it until we hear from our collaborators that they're yeah. ready to roll. So obviously yeah, I know that... people got stuff going on and you yeah. know, real big, yeah. big life events. So of course, but I'm, I've been wanting to talk about them and I will say they've stuck with me, which is, which is really good. good. Um, good. Though I feel more strongly than I did about like not enjoying Jade legacy. So I'm so curious to see what you think. Cause we know, uh, you know, Bookborn and Taylor love Jade Legacy. The whole trilogy, but especially Jade Legacy. Yes. And and I did like parts of it, but I didn't love it. Like I didn't overly uh, love it, but I, I did enjoy some pieces of it. So I, I'm so curious to see if you're going to be on my side of the fence or their side of the fence. Well, I, I can say that Jade War took me a while to get into. That the first third of it, it was just so dispersed. Uh, so where, whereas Jade city, I was boom, I was in there and I loved the, the specific locale where most of it takes place. I thought that the, it, it took on a personality of its own. And when Jade war started with kind of over here in this different part of the world, I understand what's happening now is probably we're building toward a bigger conflict, right? than we had in the first book, which is fine. Um, but it took me a little while to feel invested in, in what was happening in Jade War. Uh, when I left off, I, I'm more or less in the story. So we'll see what happens in the last third, but yeah. Yeah, there, I, I think I liked Jade War maybe the best. It's either that or City. I will say, I think it's like well worth the time. I'm really glad I read it. And I would maybe read it again too, because I wonder how I'd feel about it, like not worried about, what's happening next. Cause it is very, I mean, there's a lot of momentum at times where you're like, what in the world is about to happen. Um, so I I'd like to go into it uh, for a reread and, and read it a little bit more closely, but it's definitely unique, right? Do you, do you feel that way? That's why I said, I said it was like kind of fresh. Oh, I love the, the, the setting and the, uh, the, the take on magic, uh, yeah. which is, yeah, I, I, it's definitely uh it deserves love. I, I, I'm, I don't know if it would ever make my, I'm have to finish before I would decide that. Um, but I, I certainly would recommend people read it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I was, I was hoping it would become a, a new favor, but I don't think it's going to enter in that category, but it's definitely one that's worth discussing. Like there's just, yeah. there's too much stuff that happens in and not to discuss it. Um, and I'm wondering if people are going to think I'm just absolutely insane 
uh, for the things that I disliked about the third. But I know Book Board of Taylor is going to be like, you're wrong, but I'm excited. I'm, I'm pumped for those conversations. That's why I'm asking you because like, I'm very excited to talk about it. You, you might have the most unpopular choice for favorite character. But... Oh, without a, doubt. <laughs> without a doubt. I should make a video about that because I do feel strongly about that character. And yeah. he is terrible, but he's still my favorite. Um, Kyle Eaton says, Philip, loving the book of the new Sun Chats, would Ooh. you recommend it to Jimmy? I This is what I'm supposed to try this year. Uh, so give it to me. Give me the lowdown. The short answer is yes. I, I think Jimmy is open-minded and curious enough to handsome and give this a shot. Um, whether or not you would enjoy it, I don't know. I mean, I can tell you, I have not enjoyed Book of the New Sun the way I enjoy most of my fantasy reading, which is to say as a, an immersive story where I bond with the characters and that sort of thing. But if you approach it differently, more as a puzzle, I think, um, it's for me, that's how I've been able to enjoy it, at least. I don't feel like the characters are, at least right now, for me, most of the characters are kind of flat and they're not characters that I care a ton about, mm -hmm. but there are some mysteries. There are layers and layers of mystery, what's going on in here. And that's got me intrigued. That's got me re you know, wanting to read the next book to find out, okay, what is Gene Wolfe doing here? And what I've heard is you don't really understand the first three books until you've gotten to the end of the fourth book, that there's just a lot of that kind of, oh, when you get to the end, now this makes a lot more sense. So I'm expecting hopefully <laughs> that to happen for me. I've read the first three books. And so I, I still have the fourth. And some people say you have to read the fifth, which is not part of Book of the New Sun. It's Earth of the New Sun. Right. So I don't know. I mean, I, uh, I mean, <laughs> we'll see if, if I like the fourth <laughs> part of Book of the New Sun. Maybe I will read Earth of the New Sun as well. Um, but if, if I have to be honest, though, if I feel as lost as I do right now, when I finish Book of the New Sun, I probably won't keep reading uh, Gene Wolfe, at least not the, the New Sun books. There is some of his other books have been recommended to me that sound very intriguing as well. But yeah, uh, I've we'll heard see. his writing is incredible. I've, I've just heard that he's one of the very best when it comes to, to prose. So I, I, I have to see prose. I will say that uh, there are some really gorgeous passages in there. He's not, not the type of writer where you would necessarily notice the prose. It's not screaming, look at me, prose. Um, I'm beautiful. But he is a very talented writer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Scott says, well, I don't know that I truly understood the first three, even after finishing book four and having long discussions with Rocky. <laughs> 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 oh, man. <laughs> Library Ladder says, that's a great way to describe how to approach Gene Wolfe's book of the new sun. Excellent. That's what's worked for me right now. Um, and I'm glad I'm reading it. I will say that. Um, I am definitely glad that I'm reading mm. it. And again, this is one that I, right now, if you were to ask me, is this going to be one of your very favorite speculative fiction reads? Uh, probably not. It, it wouldn't make um, m among my very favorites. But I'm very glad that I'm reading it. And mm. I might be blown away. I'm still keeping an open mind. I might be blown away by the fourth book. And then when I realized, Oh, this was what's going on the whole time. Brilliant, you know, um, but we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. I read, um, Nomon by Nick Harkaway, which uh, a lot of people compared to book of the new sun. And it's kind of like a big brother, noir, very challenging book. Like it's very difficult to read um, because yeah. you just have no idea what's going on. And at the end it does come together and there's still stuff I don't understand, but it's really impressive. But uh, you know, I kind of pledge saying I will start book of the new sun this year, but I have to be in a mood for that kind of thing. Yeah. And I'm like just waiting and I'm like, okay, the year's going like I need to eventually start this thing. Um, that's the problem with, committing to things, and i know no one cares but me but like when i say something <laughs> i gotta do it it's just how i am yep. um so I'm, i've been kind of waiting i've been feeling maybe that it, it's a good time because right now the reading has slowed down a little bit because i have like a ton of stuff still to cover on the channel that i've read over the past few months that i've really enjoyed um so i have time right now it's not like i'm i'm jones and or you know i'm scrambling to get things to talk about for the channel so yeah. i could take some time with it and just so you know, 
uh, I'm reading it with Matt from Matt on Books and with Paul Williams. Paul was in the chat earlier. I don't know if he's still here or not, but and it's wonderful to be able to talk about it with them. Matt is using there's apparently like a there's a study guide. I don't know how official it is, but there's like this study guide that you can get for reading <laughs> Book of the New Sun. And mm -hmm. there's a glossary because one of the things that Wolf does, and I'll warn you, this is not a spoiler at all. He immediately throws all these weird words at you. You have no idea what they are. You have no idea what they look like. They're just all these strange words, but they're not made up words. They're old, old words, mostly based on Latin. Uh, so yeah, just be prepared to be like, I don't know what this is. And my approach has been just keep reading, just keep reading, you know? Yep, that's a, a cacogen. Okay, I'm going to keep reading, you know. So, and I have no idea what that is, but eventually you do start to get more ideas, but I still, there's a lot of these words that I still don't know what they are or what they look like. Yeah, I've, I, everyone's told me about the the uh, podcast, Alaba Albazo Soup or something like that. Yeah. Have you heard of it? So yeah. here's the thing. And I've heard people being like, you you need, to, but they're big breakdowns. You know what I mean? Like they're hours long. So if that's the case, and I, I don't hate to do something like that, but that means I'm going to read it over like a year, which is fine because there's no rush. You know, um, there's plenty of other people uh, talking about it. So it's not, there's plenty of content out there. Like it's not like I'm going to yeah. be first to market with my book of the new sun review. So maybe I should just do that and, and, and appreciate it because, you know, I'm always, I'm, in the middle of this right now chapter a week and uh because of bend the knee and it's awesome and then i'm also doing a uh way of kings read about two three chapters a week oh interesting okay yeah, do, doing a read along uh pod with uh lost in discovery it's called lost in roshar um so you guys can all check that cool. out he's been posting over on his channel yeah, i and saw that announcement yeah, yeah yeah it's been it's been fun uh it's been fun so maybe book of the new sun should be something like that where i take my time um and go through it or maybe i read through it and then do a reread like that like i did with blood meridian that might not be a bad idea yeah are you so. going to try to time the stormlight archive read so that you're nope. going to be no okay no yeah. now will i possibly like read the other books even as we're going through this yes like because i want to be fresh for the fifth book but okay. yeah no rush you know and there's a five-year break after book five so yeah. we got plenty of time um it was just something to jump in because i actually i don't talk about it a lot but like i really love stormlight like i really do it's it's, okay. one, of my favorite ser it's one of my favorite series it really is um, i actually did not know that i feel like because i'm so up and down on sanderson's other works and i wasn't the biggest fan of rhythm of war that people think that i like hate that series but no i mean words of radiance and oathbringer and wave kings i i they're five out of fives i love them really okay i i i've only read the first three and i like the first two a lot the third one for me like got kind of tedious um and i was afraid a little bit of rhythm of war kind of being a similar experience but I don't know. I haven't read it yet. So I will read it though. I, I, I want to continue in, in start my archive. Yeah. I think Oathbringer is, so it did work for me, but I also um, kind of felt like it was a change, like it was a shift. And I don't know how much I love the post shift of, of the world, which does concern me a little bit, but at, at the very least, the things uh, in the world building that he's built up and, and the big questions I'm super in on, dude. Like I, I should say it more. I, I really do love Stormlight. And Sanderson's not my favorite writer in the world. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm going through this chapter by chapter and I'm looking at the writing closely and it's not my favorite, but I do love his imagination quite a bit. And oh, he does I, a lot of things really well. He does a lot of things. Really oh, his well. plot, in my opinion, his plotting's phenomenal. I mean, uh -huh. Murphy, Jimmy has a time turner. <laughs> How you do all your reading, right? There's not that many hours in a day. I, uh, you and Hermione, I think, right? I got up at 6.30 or 7 a.m. my time to record the last Lost in Roshar episode. So I did it before work. And then I, well, I went to the gym after, and then I went to work. So yeah, burn, burning the midnight oil. But I, it, it's all good. You know, doing a, a podcast, it's an hour a week, so it's not, it's not that bad. And, and I'm very thankful that the two podcasts I'm on, that the other person is taking care of a lot of the overhead stuff. So, but hence the caffeine that you injected in your veins before this. 
<laughs> yeah, you know, I just need to quit my job. That's all. Except none of this uh, would ever even come <laughs> close to being a full time thing. So yeah, you just have to stop eating and living in a house. And- yeah, which you know, who needs it? <laughs> so book of the new sun okay um i wanted to highlight this brandon said jimmy i'm going to be starting the tawny man trilogy very soon thank you for introducing me to realm of the eldings you're awesome thank you brandon those are the best comments awesome ever. tawny man the- is amazing i love the tawny man trilogy yeah that's tawny as far man. as i got uh i'm gonna start uh the next the um the tetralogy soon the um what's it called jimmy come on help me Oh, Rainwild Chronicles. Rainwild Chronicles, yes. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. not your favorite part of the... Uh... <laughs> it is not my favorite part. Oh, dear. <laughs> However, I do think they're, they're better than I give them credit for. And I do think there are some moments in them that could be some of the best in the series. Um, I've also noticed that people who don't like Realm of the Elderlings, they get through it and go, that was not good. Um, they tend to like Rainwild Chronicles more than everybody else who doesn't like Rainwild Chronicles. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. I knew Derry was going to be upset when I made the poop. I, I was but... just thinking, is Derry hearing that? Uh oh, you're in trouble, uh, man. Hey, listen, I'm just, I got to be fair. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Books of Bangs Con just finished Life Ship Masterpiece of a Trilogy. Uh, it's my oh, it's Ship of so Destiny, good. I think, is my wife's favorite book now. She finished that up a little while ago and wow. she's doing some other things, uh, but she's going to be getting back to Tawny Man soon. So that's going to be extremely exciting for me. And I love hearing her talk about stuff because she's not in our sphere. <laughs> so she has wildly different points and likes and dislikes and awesome. thoughts. And it really is eye opening. I-, I talked about this with uh, Joanna Murphy and Alan, cause we were talking about the regurgitation of certain things, right? Uh, like you're responsible for a lot of it because you're the Malazan guy. Oh, so I'll watch a Malazan. I'll watch a Malazan discussion that you're not on, and I'll go. Well, Philip said. <laughs> I'm like talking about Philip. Get him out of here. No, but it does ghost happen. Of, right? The ghost of Philip hovers over every Malazan discussion. Yeah. Or they'll be like, I heard this somewhere, and I'm like, it was Philip. It's always Philip. <laughs> Actually, it was probably AP, not me. It was either AP or you. I think that covers like a good 60 to 70%. No, I mean, I love the stuff that you guys have done. <laughs> but we were talking about how sometimes there almost becomes tropes about what we talk about. And I was talking about how there was a guy at Jiu-Jitsu who read Wheel of Time and he had no idea the slog existed. That's I was the same way. I, I read Wheel of Time. With, I, I was completely, I didn't know BookTube was a thing. I read Wheel of Time just because I was trying to broaden my fantasy reading. This is when I... Around the time, I also, I think, subsequently read Malazan for the first time. And, you know, I was getting to Joe Abercrombie and other things. I had already read A Song of Ice and Fire uh, and, and loved that. So I did not know about the slog and I did not experience the slog at all. But I will say I did feel as I was reading Wheel of Time, you know, I think these books would be even better if they were just a little bit shorter. You know, I, I was saying that throughout the read. Hmm. Not just not just focused on those middle books that people call the slog. I didn't experience that, but anyway. Yeah, uh, but that is it. You know, if someone tells you that you're going to experience something and it's, and it's at least in your head and you are affected by it, right? Um, but the, <laughs> when I told him the slog, he's like, what does that mean? I was like, you know, the slog. And he's like, "I, bro, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and then it reminds me that I'm a weirdo that talks about books on the internet. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. I'm weird. <laughs> How could I forget? Um, Evie wants me to recognize her comment. Uh, everyone should read uh, Spear Cuts Through Waters by Simon Jimenez. Uh, <laughs> Evie, I'm, I'm shocked that you would say that. The Vanished Birds was phenomenal. Great book. Yeah. It should have made my top 10 last year. I just was dumb that day and didn't put it on there. Which I will read that eventually, by the way, Evie. The spear cuts through water. Beautiful writing. Absolute beautiful writing. Stretches, rules of perspective and stuff. You'll, you will have a strong appreciation for it, for sure. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. I hear good things. So. Yeah. From Evie and others. <laughs> Mostly Evie, though. Mostly Evie. A lot from Evie. Uh, I feel like, and this is kind of a somber tone, but I feel like uh, I have to mention the fact that, you know, we, Cormac McCarthy passed away recently. Yeah. And just... Um, uh, you know, um, a gigantic piece of American 
literature and in and, and my reading experience, for sure. One of my favorite authors of all time uh, and the experience that I've had with his books can never be replicated uh, by anyone else. And also some of my favorite books were inspired by him, which, mm. which is also uh, makes sense, right? Uh, especially the sequels in the second apocalypse series by R. Scott Baker, heavily inspired by Blood Meridian. Uh, and he was very upfront about that. Uh, I want to read this quote and I posted on my, my uh, community tab. So I'm sure people saw it, but I think it's like one of the best quotes I've ever read. And uh, it's every man's death is standing in for every other. And since death comes to all, there is no way to abate the fear of it, except to love the man who stands for us. We are not waiting for his history to be written. He passed here long ago. That man is all men and who stands in the dock for all, us until our time has come and we must stand for him do you love him that man will you honor that path he has taken will you honor his tale and uh yeah rest in peace to, to cormac mccarthy uh i i would be a liar to say it didn't affect me greatly uh it was very sad yeah no he was definitely a huge presence in in our, uh, of our time. I mean, he's absolutely been a great influence and, uh, a lot of people, uh, love his, his stories. And he, that, uh, is a legacy that, uh, is, uh, is a beautiful, wonderful thing. You know, I personally have only read the road. Uh, I haven't read uh, as much, nearly as much as you have of his work, but, uh, that left a huge impression on me, the road. Uh, oh yeah had a good time with it actually in, in some respects, just looking at what he does. He is different. I mean, in many respects, he's, he's kind of a minimalist um, and doesn't really care too much about punctuation, <laughs> which I got used to really fast. Um, so I thought that was kind of fun uh, as well, but uh, I, I would like to read more of his stuff someday. For sure. Uh, I encourage everyone to at least try it. You know, it's not for everyone, but nothing ever is. Um, He's also a much funnier guy than people give him credit for, in my opinion. Um, mm. A lot of it is very, very bleak, so I'm not disagreeing with that. And he has written some oh, of the darkest yeah. stuff ever. But he also has some of the uh, funniest things I've ever read. I'm trying to find this quote um, that I saw online. So basically, James Franco really wanted to make blood meridian and he was talking to <laughs> he was talking to him about some of his works and the uh the article said this actor james franco who adapted child of god mr mccarthy's 1973 novel about a necrophiliac into an independent film that recently made its debut at the toronto film festival uh says mr mccarthy offered very little guidance for the film he doesn't give answers about his work mr franco said in an interview when mr franco called mr mccarthy and asked him why he had written a book about such a repellent character his response was verbatim I don't know, James. Probably some dumbass reason. <laughs> I've seen him interviewed, and he's not the the easiest interviewee. I don't know if you've how many of his interviews you've watched. Oh, I've watched. There's only three of them. So yeah, I've watched them. All. <laughs> yeah, and he is a, well concise in his responses. Often, I think you're better off getting water out of a stone if you want to ask him about his writing. He doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. He's not interested. So I, I was in San Antonio. This is on topic about 10, 12 days ago. I was in San Antonio and my, my wife was at a conference. So I went to some bookstores and I found this really cool bookstores called uh, like, Ant I think it was just called anti books. It was right next to a half price books, which I thought was interesting. So I go in, I meet this guy. I think his name was Bob, if I'm remembering correctly. And I'm talking to Bob and we're just talking about books. I'm basically doing a chatting with nuts with no camera with this guy. He's a great guy. Great, great book collection as well. And he says, you know, McCarthy used to come in here a lot. You ever read him? I said, oh, man, one of my favorite authors. He goes, yeah, he used to come in here when he lived in El Paso. I said, oh, OK. He uh -huh. said, you know, I haven't read his, his, his recent books, but he had me ship him all these books on psychology. And I said, that book is going to be boring. <laughs> That's what he said. That's so funny. <laughs> but he said he had been shipping. So he used to actually sell books to McCarthy when he lived in El Paso. And he, for 20 years, has been mailing him books. And he was like a regular customer of him so how interesting joe abercrombie was a psychology major too and i think it shows oh i didn't know that yeah very yep. interesting yeah um we did have a super chat which uh thank you so much very generous uh danelle says philip 
Will you read Berserk? I will someday. I can't say specifically when. I, I'm curious. I, I'm very curious. I have now two and a half manga under my belt. So <laughs> still You're basically an expert at this point. Am I? No, I don't think so. Uh, I'm more or less still a newbie, but uh, I really enjoyed Vinland Saga a ton and also Vagabond uh, even more, if that's possible. And now I'm in the middle of Monster, which uh, I know that uh, you and Alan recently read, right? Um, we did? Yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> I loved Monster. It is my, to, to right now, it's my favorite manga of all time. Is that right? Wow. I, okay. Philip, it's one of my favorite stories of all time. Like, I love it. Okay. okay. Uh, you, so how far are you into it? One volume? No. Well, uh, re we've only released one of our, so I'm, I'm reading along with Murphy um, and just having a blast. Uh, the discussions make me love it even more, actually. Um, mm -hmm. That's been true for each of the manga. That's true for pretty much any book I read. Yeah. So um, we have only released one of videos, but we're actually uh, recording a little bit ahead of that. So I'm getting not quite halfway through the read, but um, getting close to halfway through the read. So, yeah. Nice. So, yeah, I have all kinds of questions still, but I'm getting a better sense of what's going on. I'm at that point. Kind of a uh, almost a historical fiction at this point. Right. It's uh, it's interesting. Do you feel any of the Stephen King inspiration? Because Urasawa is a huge fan of Stephen King. I could see that. Well, I should preface my answer by saying I've only read the Dark Tower series by Stephen King. I haven't read any of his other stuff. Wait, so Really? Yeah, that's it. Just Dark Tower. I've only read Dark Tower. Is that bad? <laughs> I mean, I I hadn't read any Stephen King until I had a channel and people were saying, oh, you should try Dark Tower. You should try it. And I was like, oh. You live in the Northeast. Yeah. New Englander. Yeah. You're American. You read. Yeah. And, you've only, and, and then out of all the King, you're like, the one I'm going to read is Dark Tower. Well, I'm a fantasy guy. So... Fantasy. I'm just blown away. I can't. <sighs> <laughs> what else, Jimmy? What should I read besides? Guys, why do you listen to Philip? Like, why does anyone? No, <laughs> What's the next Stephen King you would read? Yeah, you tell me. I would love if you read Pet Cemetery. I'd love to talk to you about it. Okay. That that's one of the hardest hitting books I've ever read. And I also think it's one of King's strongest endings as well because people give him crap for that all the time. Or you could read Under the Dome with me in October which is like a thousand pages and unanimously people say the ending's terrible, but apparently the 99% before that is like phenomenal. So very excited to be let down. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. That's not the best. That was not your best sales pitch. I'm afraid. <laughs> well, Murphy's right. I'm not sure King is for Philip, but I bet he'd like 11, 22, 63. Well, Murphy, you have to remember that Philip is old. So he will really like a lot of the older references that Stephen King uh, puts in there. For in sure. all serious, in all seriousness, eleven twenty two sixty three is one of my favorite books of all time. It's so yeah, great. that that seems to be one of the most loved Stephen King books. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was thinking of reading the ones that sort of tie into Dark Tower more, but that's a lot of them in a way. <laughs> yeah. There's a ton. I, I will say this: so I haven't read all of the stuff that ties in Dark Tower, but for me, Dark Tower was almost a motivator to go read the tie-ins, like instead of the other way around, because a lot of people. Yeah. who love Stephen King weren't keen on a seven book weird. I don't even know how you describe it. Honestly, it's a fantasy, I guess it's, it's, everything. it's not, I mean, it's a Western, it's a fantasy, it's science fiction, it's dystopian, it's kind of horror. It's got everything. So, yeah, I think, uh, I think that that's also one of those ones that is hard to review. Uh, Dark Tower. Like, who's it for? <laughs> I don't know who these books are for. It's for people who are comfortable being uncomfortable. Wow. That's why people listen to you. I just figured it out because that was a beautiful way of saying that. <laughs> that was very well spoken. It's just sort of nonsensical in a way, but yeah. But but exactly it. Yeah. That's it. That That's a one sentence Dark Tower recommendation review. There it is. There we go. Would yeah. you put Dark Tower in your top 10 favorite series? Yes. I thought so. I, th yep. I think when you made your series video, it was in there. If I it's in there. Yeah. 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 Yep. 
Do you have a favorite character of all time? Oh gosh. Uh, favorite character of all time. I mean like fantasy or just all time, just in fiction. Oh my goodness. I don't even have a list that I thought through. Um, of course there are certain characters that are dear to me because I grew up reading them like Gandalf, for example. From okay, Lord just don't Ray. say Frodo. Just don't say Frodo. I like Frodo. Um, but I, I, Gandalf would be my favorite probably from that series. Um, so yeah, I've always kind of identified with old men, I guess, <laughs> old bearded. <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah gandalf maybe i'll just say gandalf what the heck yeah i'm i'm fine with that yeah i'm fine with that i mean he he was is he the first wizard like mentor guardian trope like is he the creation of that trope no 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 i mean he's in part based on odin in some ways the way odin looks at least okay. uh happens. there's merlin you know, uh, there's, this is goes way back. Uh, so there's, there are all kinds of, uh, examples of this going back into mythology, you know, Gandalf is most definitely an archetype, um, that goes way, way back. So, uh, he's my favorite example of that archetype, but you, you have many others that uh, fantasy readers will immediately recognize like Dumbledore or, you know, whatever. I mean, they're, they're the, the wise Obi-Wan Kenobi, you know, um, is another version of it. They're all the same archetype in many ways. So uh, I like the Gandalf version. I do too. And Odin's a really good example. I, I, that, that, that's a very, I was just talking about Odin because he is very similar to the um, three-eyed crow uh, or blood, blood Raven in the song of ice and fire. Um, oh. Well, one eye, like there's a lot of Odin to him. And Yggdrasil yeah. and, and tons of other stuff. Well, Odin um, is way creepier too, though, than, than Gandalf. Like he's a he's actually a pretty cruel guy sometimes. Yeah, uh, it, there's a chance Odin is closer to Blood Raven, maybe, than yeah. than Gandalf. I mean, I would say so. Yeah. 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 Um I brought up Frodo and I put a poll up like a month ago and it has 902 votes. I said, Who's the better hobbit? Frodo or Bilbo? And now yeah. the real answer, the, the real answer, and everyone said this, but like that wasn't part of the question. It's obviously Samwise. Like Samwise is definitely. Oh yeah, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, like, that's obvious. But um, the vote came in, and I mean, we're talking Bush Gore levels of controversy here. Uh, we did a recount. Wow. Frodo won with fifty-one percent of the vote. Oh, fifty-one. I, I almost deleted my channel. I was so mad. It's a, it's obviously Bilbo. Like it's not even close dude are you a frodo hater jimmy is that what this yes is? oh he my sucks. god the man confesses it in public i i actively dislike frodo this He's is the like worst. you are aspiring to alan levels of of being a hater there the only thing worse He's than frodo is, is the fact that i love samwise and samwise never takes a second to be like maybe i should be the main character <laughs> Like Sam, I should have bucked back against the system a bit. Actually, you know what? My favorite Hobbit, totally underrated Hobbit, Mary. Okay. Okay. I, I can get behind that. I would even get behind Pippin. He's a moron, but like I'm in. Pippin is good for, for laughs, but Mary is, is the wisest Hobbit. I'd rather go to my DMV than hear Frodo ever talk again. <laughs> No, wait, Jimmy, is this Elijah Wood Frodo that you object to, or is it book Frodo, or is it both? Guys, the movies are better than the books. Of course I'm talking. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I actually like Elijah Wood quite a bit, and I actually like that performance. But um, no, I don't, like, I don't like book Frodo or movie Frodo. I'm sorry. I know that makes me terrible, but I just yeah. think Bilbo's so much more interesting. Like, he... he you know, you got to stand on the shoulders of giants. You better and, check your sub count after this live stream because well, half might, of them will be gone according to this poll. Because, Alan will be calling you, you know, seven K Jimmy. Seven K Jimmy. <laughs> we can't have any regression here, folks. The sponsors are on my back. Okay. <laughs> Murphy said, yes. "Jen, subscribe." Yes, your, Wait, your sponsor, your Viagra sponsor, or whatever, whatever. Well, that's on Bend the Knee. That's Hims. Oh. Hims.com slash Bend the Knee for 20% off Viagra pills. <laughs> I don't know. 
<laughs> Wait, you should see the. I might send you the outtakes of me trying to read that ad. <laughs> so, <laughs> you should post it on your channel. Oh, I can't post. <laughs> I ad libbed. I went way off script. Oh dear, okay. it was not good. Um, so we're bringing up Frodo and how he's terrible. And um, I asked you to check out Epic Poo, Michael Moorcock. Epic Poo, yes. Epic Poo, Michael, Michael Moorcock. Michael yeah. Moorcock, not a fan of C.S. Lewis and Tolkien, would you say? I think that's a fair statement. Did yes. he get that across in the? <laughs> I think he made that much clear. Yes, in his little essay. Yeah. I uh, I talked to tad when he came on because i said tad you're kind of in the middle here like you're a tolkien stan but michael moorcock's like a huge inspiration as well and a friend of yours and he explained that a lot of the criticism in epic poo was based around class and yeah. kind of talking about like the samwise like everyone just being okay with the system as it is uh and then there's like this feeling of things that are outside of our our home and what we know is dangerous therefore bad evil and evil is not explored in any sort of nuanced way right. um right. now i'm not saying i agree with everything Moorcock has said but i do think it's a i don't know did you find it interesting at least to read yeah i have a i have thoughts uh, by the way it's epic poo as in winnie the poo p-o-o yes. with an h uh so yeah epic Moorcock basically said that um lord of the rings is like winnie the poo essentially yes. yeah. and he also lumped in c.s lewis and all the people who met at oxford and yeah, he actually, he included quite a bit of, uh, quite a few authors in his kind of lumped them all into this, basically the gist of it. I, I, I want to be fair to what he said, uh, mm. which was, you talked about the class thing. Um, and there's this, these are authors who are reinforcing in a reactionary way, some of the old class divisions and affirming them as a positive thing. And they also tend to be more anti-urban. They favor this idealized version of rural life, the Shire and all of that. Um, mm -hmm. And they tend to portray a more simplistic morality um, that they lack nuance. Is that fair, Jimmy? Am I, is that all part of his cr criticisms? Yeah, and uh, I think he also tended to have problems with the like the way it was written. Like, I got the feeling he was not. I think he didn't hate Tolkien's writing, but he was very critical of C.S. Lewis's writing. Like, yeah, so I, he he got in some cheap shots about their uh, prose as well. Yeah. Um, in the process of lumping them all into this reactionary kind of uh, philosophy or or way of writing, I guess. He also hated Richard Adams, uh, it pretty much it sounded like, because yeah. he was really down on Watership Down. Uh, he was not a fan. Not a fan, yeah. He so, also took a shot at Peak as well, um, Mervyn Peak and Gorman Guest. Yeah, I thought he was on the, he had some, so he, he brought up others that he thought were great, like he mentioned Le Guin, for example, um, and others that presumably are closer to his worldview, I guess which is much more critical of the status quo, which is very critical of the class system, which has obviously inflicted a lot of pain on a lot of people over many, many centuries. Uh, so yeah, he, he has a list of writers that he kind of likes as uh, examples of fantasy writers who are more or less challenging this older view. Um, so, and also yeah. in the way that they're written, he was saying how he felt like yeah. some child authors were actually trusting of their readers more than someone like Tolkien or definitely yeah. C.S. Lewis. I think that was a little bit more aimed at C.S. Lewis. Yeah, he sort of he regards them as kind of patronizing in their in their prose as well. I mean, by some crazy coincidence, all the authors who agree with his worldview have excellent prose and the authors that he's criticizing suck. So uh, at writing, <laughs> <laughs> I might be exaggerating this slightly there, uh, but yeah, that's but more or less, more or less where it falls, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, wh wh what did you think of it? And as someone who writes fantasy, you know, did, did yeah. you find yourself reflecting at all? Did you find any of it? Um, did he make you think at all? I think it's actually all in all, not a great essay. Um, it's, I think uh, very simplistic in this division that he's 
asserted. Uh, I think he's missing a lot of nuance himself in lumping all these authors into these categories. And so I, I would overall say that I, uh, while I probably am closer to Moorcock's worldview than I am to Tolkien's worldview, I don't think is a very fair essay. I think it's a little bit petty in places, to be honest with you. Um, and certainly uh, uncharitable, let's put it that way. Uh, so I think he's, he's, he's created this dichotomy without any regard for all the nuance. So just take Tolkien, because he takes the most hits, I think, in the essay. Um, if you look at Tolkien, yes, it is true that you have a good side and a bad side and Sauron is evil and the orcs are evil and all of that. That's, I'm not going to try to argue against that, but to say that there's no nuance at all in Lord of the Rings, I think is an exaggeration. He also, uh, I think he misinterpreted the idea of like the lush landscapes and green being good. I think it's very much an environmental message where he is, he took it as an anti-urban message, which I don't necessarily, I, I guess I can't say that that didn't maybe play a role in it, but like, I feel like one of the strongest pieces of Lord of the Rings is saying, Hey, nature is good. Absolutely. Tolkien is, and this goes back. So Moorcock is right uh, about certain historical trends and and certain inspirations behind fantasy i mentioned we mentioned william Mor he mentions william morris as well in the essay he's critical mm -hmm. of william morris as well and he kind of dismisses um this goes back to i, I don't want to go too far back but basically in the late 18th century you had industrialization happen and it started in england and at the same time capitalism was becoming the dominant way of doing things in, in that part of the world. So this is something that happened throughout the 19th century. So there was a lot of dislocation. There was a lot of change. The old ways were being in many ways, not just challenged, but even tossed out. You had a, a long tradition of a kind of feudal society with an aristocracy. And now this aristocracy was being replaced by a group of capitalists who were making wealth in a different way that wasn't based on land ownership. So you're moving from an agrarian rural society to an industrial society. And many people in England at the time were highly, highly distressed and critical of this to the extent that people, writers like Thomas Carlyle and John Ruskin and William Morris was very influenced by them. But many people were critical of the exploitation because yes, um, Capitalism and industrialization did result in a lot of people going through this giant meat grinder of, uh, you know, all these factories. And yeah, there were awful, awful things that happened, all kinds of expert child labor, all kinds of really just awful things that you can read a Dickens book, right? read hard times. If you want to know how it was for your average worker in industrialized England in the 19th century. So a lot of people idealized the medieval past saying, oh, times were great, and, and, which is obviously not a completely <laughs> accurate view. Right. But they basically said, hey, you know, back in the Middle Ages, back in earlier times, they took care of each other. There was this social system. Yes, there were people on top and people on the bottom, but there was, they were in a symbiotic relationship. And everybody knew their place. They had a place. Whereas in industrial society, you're just fodder, right? Um, so mm -hmm. they were basically trying to reassert this older these older ways. And so they idealized the past and Tolkien is definitely connected to this tradition of idealizing the past, idealizing the rural over the urban being uh, highly critical of machinery and industrialization and all of that. So he definitely does. He is connected to that tradition. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I like you, I think that there's an important environmental message there, right? I, I thought so. I mean, that's one of the things whenever I read as an adult that stuck out to me pretty vividly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think in terms of morality, let's talk about that because to, to read Moorcock's essay, you would think that there's no nuance at all in Lord of the Rings. And I disagree. I think that there is some nuance. There's, I think Boromir is, was what I was thinking of as sure. I read through it. I said, well, that's so Philip, I will say this. I've heard, and I don't know if this is true, so big asterisks. I don't know if it's true, but I've seen some people say that Moorcock never read Lord of the Rings and that he had skimmed it, um, that he had admitted that afterwards. And I, I don't know if that's true, but 
Yeah, I, I'll I be have... honest. Not being able to see Boromir as something that is definitely nuanced, and if that's true, I think then that I I have an even lower opinion of this essay. Um, but I don't know if that's true or not. So yeah, I'm not, I, that's. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt, and and I I do too. You know, I, maybe I, he read the he read Lord of the Rings. But, but Boromir does seem like an obvious. Point. Boromir is an obvious example. I mean, I'm not sure people care about spoilers for lord of the rings but we're fine <laughs> we're fine okay if you haven't i'm just gonna say something about the ending of lord of the rings okay so if, uh, for, for like 30 seconds plug yours if you want to hear this but who's the hero of lord of the rings you could argue it's Gollum. Hmm. frodo fails right that that ring would not have been disposed of if it hadn't been for Gollum. they never would have gotten there yeah. You have a, a character. You can't just say that Gollum is pure evil. Okay. And also the treatment of Gollum, I think, you know, between Samwise yeah. and Frodo and that whole dynamic. There's Smeagol know, that... within Gollum. There's a redeemable human character there. He's not pure yeah. evil. Uh, and you have obviously good characters who are tempted by the ring, who obviously have the capacity to commit great evil. And they recognize that within themselves. Like even Gandalf does, right? So the, I think there's if you if you're willing to look, there's plenty of nuance in terms of morality in Lord of the Rings. If you if I'm not saying I'm not arguing that it is an extremely nuanced uh, type of morality because you do have good and evil and they're fairly clear. And in some ways, there's a I think there's a lot of criticism that people could uh, m make on. The portrayal of certain races and certain people and the way orcs can be just taken as uh, as fodder as you know there's never a moment when people reflect i think in lord of the rings where it's like oh too bad all these lives had to be lost you know it's just yay good triumphs you know so mm -hmm. um, so yeah i'm not saying it's the most nuanced but to say there's no nuance at all i think is is not true yeah I would agree with that. And yeah, and Beth says that Sam Wise even has some less than charitable moments. Yeah. 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 I would agree with that. I, I had a feeling that's probably where you were going to end up on it. Um, I've read the essay like three or four times now, and I always enjoy reading it. Um, not that I agree with all of it anyways, but I, I wanted to read it again recently since I've read Elric. And, I, and I'll be honest, I loved Elric, the, mm -hmm. the first full. Not, have you read it? Have you read? No, the no. Movie? I actually do want to read uh, Moorcox. I thought it was fantastic. I was, I was very surprised. Uh, my review covers all that. So if you guys haven't heard my thoughts on it, go check out my Elric review. Um, I, 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 I have a lot of respect for Moorcox uh, and for what he brought to the genre. And like one of the right. things I, I talked about him kind of being anti Tolkien in my review, but one of the things that I did not mention is the fact that he also was kind of writing an anti Conan the barbarian character mm -hmm. as well. Elric is not just uh, Philip. When I went into it, I thought Elric was just a Chad going to be raffle stomping everybody. And it turns out that Elric is far more complicated than that. Like I was shocked. Yeah. Um, and then you throw in honestly, just the fantasy stuff and it's awesome, dude. Like it's great. Yeah. You know, you got magic swords, this kingdom and the different races and, and it all worked for me. Um, I would love for you to read it. Um, hopefully that I will. Hopefully that essay doesn't affect your enjoyment of it. Not at um, all. No, I, I'm fine with reading his creative work and separating that from the essay. And I, I went into the essay knowing something about it. And, mm -hmm. and you gave me that homework assignment, by the way, everybody. Jimmy gave me homework for chatting with nuts. I had to read this essay or he wouldn't let me be here tonight, actually. That's what he said. Right, it was on my brain, man. And I, and I, and I <laughs> wanted to, you know, you're a Tolkien guy. It has influenced you greatly in your writing. And I just yeah. wanted to hear, you know, from your perspective. And plus I had just read, um, read it again and had read Elric. So I thought it would be a, a good time to bring it up uh, real yeah. quick. I wanted to know. I'm glad I read it, by the way. I'm really glad. I'm, and I thank you for the homework. If, if <laughs> you're anytime, if you, if you're at all interested in it, it's free. Just type in Epic Poo. Uh, it's literally the first results, 13 yeah. pages. People should um, read it. People should read it. I think, I mean, it's one of the most famous essays ever. And Raf has a video on it actually on his channel. Um, yeah. He's a very, very big fan of the essay um, and has a lot to say about it. So if you're curious about more perspectives on it, you know, go check out his video. Uh, Davidson says, Philip, have you ever read Tolstoy's critiques of Shakespeare? I have not. Yeah. That I haven't good. either, but I've heard they're mandatory. I've heard if you like Tolstoy, it's, it's a very good thing to go and read. And I do know that Tolstoy oh. was not a fan of Dostoevsky. Uh, he yes. said nice things at, at his memorial, but 
he was with Virginia Wolf. He was not a fan of Dostoevsky. So huh. um, it's interesting, these creatives, when they butt heads. Yeah, well, they, they're they slightly different ages, slightly different uh, outlooks, I guess. It's like, you know, Moorcock and Tolkien. You know, if you're outside of fantasy, you think, oh, they're just fantasy writers, right? But if yeah. you're somebody who's invested in the genre, you know there are big differences there. And the same is true of pretty much any type of uh, fiction. Uh, and I'm sure there were some uh, rivalries uh, among great writers of, of various places and, and genres. So yeah, they're, they're different in their, their outlooks, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I also think it was a little more acceptable to be critical. And, you know, we're saying Moorcock hated Tolkien. He, he probably didn't hate him. He probably just didn't like his work. Right. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I it was I, pretty I, brutal. <laughs> it was, it was brutal. that essay is, is, I think, a little excessive um and it's he, it's almost like a a snarky teenager uh who is kind of learned a little bit of sophisticated vocabulary and wants to show it off and is kind of uh you know crapping all over his parents you know this is the meanest i've ever heard you uh say anything this is fantastic we did it we got him we got him ladies and gentlemen yeah uh, Matt says Tolstoy and Dostoevsky are very different. They are. Um, Tolstoy believed very much that first a story should be entertaining and, and have a through line. And then the ideas come. Uh, Dostoevsky did not, <laughs> did not feel that way. A um, little less subtlety at times uh, with, with what he was fitting into his stories. But Philip, I want to thank you so much for coming on. I know you're a busy man. I mean, you released a book this week, folks go check out the profit of the Dan. If you haven't read wave of Dan, it's out there, go check it out uh, on Amazon. And you can also look for the audio book here in a few months. For yes. Wave of Dan. So we are hoping be- end of the summer. So yeah, I will update as soon as I know anything, but uh, it's going to be fun. Absolutely. Well, Philip, I, uh, I'm excited to read book two. I'm excited to see book three come out and, uh, I appreciate you giving me some of your Friday night, man. Oh, it's been a, an incredible pleasure. I always love getting together with you, my dear friend, Jimmy, and, uh, thank you for having me on and thank you everybody in the chat as well. I have been reading your comments as we've been chatting and I really appreciate your presence here. Yeah. Excellent uh, turnout. And as always, chat adds so much to the conversation and brings uh, new information. I always learn something from chat every week. You guys could be lying to me and I wouldn't know. Um, So, you know, I'm kind of at at your will, but we appreciate it nonetheless. And (laughs) I want to thank everyone for taking time out your Friday night to check this out. Everyone watching after the fact. Thank you. You can hit like if you liked it, dislike if you dislike it. Um, If you're a big Frodo fan, sorry, he's not (laughs) he's not always all cracked up to be. (laughs) Uh, but you know, everyone can be wrong about some things and maybe I am here. So until we see you next time, be good, be safe. And remember to always keep turning the page.